it will take a turn you know a little bit more inside versus a larger rider is going to have to go a little bit wider because their center of gravity here we're saying uh celine uh del carmen alvarado here uh taking two wins um last weekend not this weekend yesterday uh losing to uh anna marie worst but definitely today could be something for her yeah, definitely. We'll go full screen on the start line. If you don't know the format, so we have the elite women live. There's Annemiek van Vluten for Mitchelton Scott. We then have our halftime show. Get involved over on the chat forums on YouTube and Facebook and uh, on Twitter. I'm at Marty Mac TV. So if you want to tweet me, I'll keep track of that. It's at Jeremy Powers. If you uh, want to uh, tag Jeremy in them as well, we'll take your your questions, your comments, and then at half time, if you kind of work out as well the men's race uh, when we uh, we go kind of live 2 p.m. Uh, in the UK, that's 3 p.m. in Europe, so we have about a, a 20 25 minutes uh, gap in between the two races, and then we come back for the men's race. But Anna Meek, you can see down here on uh, the start line. And uh, she'll be, again, as we said, she'll have realistic objectives today. Uh, let's run you through. We saw uh, some, some run you through some of your other riders. So Inga van der Heiden, you can see there for CCC Live. As we said, uh, Jeremy and I, we're taking the pronunciation police correction on uh, Alice Maria Azufi from Italy. Ava Lechner as well from uh, Italy is in there as well. Uh, Yara Kasteline, Annick van Alphen, watch out for her. British fans, uh, Anna Flynn, uh, you can watch out for Anna Flynn. Katie Scott, Isbel Strafti as well in there for British fans, for Spanish fans, Maria Parajon Fuentes, there's Anna Marie Hurst, Ellen Van Loy in for Telenet Bauer's Lions, uh, Sana Kant, she'll be hoping that she has a bit of a better day. There's our Zufi, uh, Manon Bakker in the background there. Here's Inga van der Heiden to so the world under 23 champion. They are watching the lights, they are cr crouched, poised, and ready. A lot of attention around uh, Anna Meek. Great to see the world road champion uh, here and uh, dipping her toe into the uh, in to the cyclocross uh, mud today and uh, she definitely uh, picked a day for it look at the focus on sana kant's face she this is uh, her series so 102 points she took this series with last year animally first betsimo alvarado azufi and away we go we are off and uh, racing the world champion in that rainbow jersey ellen van loy straight down the center del carmen alvarado katie keo Trying to get a good start, but Inga van der Heiden it is in the orange of CCC Live. Just hangs that left foot out there, Jeremy. She gets the whole shot through that first corner. Oh, ride it down. Yeah, we've got somebody sliding out. You can tell the conditions as we see Annemiek van Vluten just making her way through. We really, I mean, obviously a great start, but gosh, Marty, the story today at the start here anyway is Annemiek van Vluten racing this race. I mean, the, the current road world champion out here racing how how crazy is that so just getting uh, through there it's uh Annemoon van Dienst uh, who's there that's uh leading out here to Ellen van Loy leading through here uh, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado van der Heiden Manon Bakker getting herself up there. Uh, Monique van der Rey, uh, you can see there, wearing number 20, Monique van der Rey. She had a bit of a, a, bit of a coming together, you could say, uh, yesterday, right on the start line. So she's got herself a better start today. So a lot of the uh, under 23s as well uh, are well up there. Puck Peters, watch out for Puck Peters as well. So your British riders, Anna Flynn's wearing 48. So watch out for uh, number 48. There's Anna Meek getting over the uh, over the uh, the planks there. The world uh, road champion. So not uh, 69. Katie Scott, number 70 is Ishbel Strati. So. Uh, Anna Meek, as you said, Jeremy, realistic objectives, no bunny hop in the barriers today. <laughs> I don't think so. That's probably the uh, the team that you're at for, probably uh, Mitchell and Scott probably said, you know what, uh, yes, you can race. Uh, sign this piece of paper that you won't do anything crazy, <laughs> please. <laughs> yeah, sign, sign, sign this waiver. So good to see you. Yeah. It's good to see, though. It's, it's great. That, oh, uh, man. They've given it's her the, the permission. Best. I believe I believe back in the day I used to do Lowenhout and uh, also called Azen, Azen Cross, which is uh, in December. I believe Philip Gilbert came out a couple times and did quite well there. I, I 
I think he was in like maybe twenties, the mid twenties. But you know, the Road Riders again, they don't have all of the skill sets, but they they have you know they have the power. They they obviously technically can handle their bike just fine. They can go down descent super fast. They have the hand eye coordination, the reaction speed. They just don't have the the skill necessarily off road with the slick conditions and things like that. So yeah, you you know, but what an awesome thing to have. I wonder if this is close to her home in the Netherlands, which is why it was a uh, an easy. Yes, I would like to come out and do this event. And this is one of the best camera shots that you get in cyclocross. The cable cam across the sand here leading out. It's uh, Inga van der Heiden from uh, CCC Live in the orange. So leading out Sana Kant just uh, moving up. There's Manon Backer for Experza and uh, Shirin Van Anroy there in the green and white moves up as well. Van Anroy, Van der Rey there, Ava Lechner trying to get her way through. Annick Van Alphen gets there. There's Katie Keogh just going through. Castelline and our Zufi a little bit further back at the moment, Jeremy, than they, than they would like to be. It just shows the sort of washing machine effect right at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, that type of course, you know, and as you can see, the riders are having to get off, which is going to create that yo-yo even more. It looks like this was that shot that we saw from a different angle when the, when the men, we got those pre-race pre shots of the men pre-riding, looking like they were trying to go up on the grass on that right side to just get off a little bit later, maybe save a couple, of, uh, you know, get a couple more pedal strokes in. But as you can see, the, the women here are just absolutely ripping it up and... Look at the mud. Ellen Van Loy is uh, leading out here now. Manon Bakker moves up on the outside in the pink and white. Great line by Manon Bakker. Takes the high road there. We saw Tone Arts trying to warm up on that line. Manon Bakker goes, uh, goes wide. Can she keep riding it? She's looking good at the moment. Van der Heiden on the left, though. It looks like it's a little bit quicker to run, but hats off there to Manon Bakker, who uh, uses, the, uh, uses the barrier to keep herself going. Uh, get big respect for that move. Yeah, I mean, it looks like it looks totally crazy. It looks like mayhem right now. I mean, they're just <laughs> there's obviously we've got the sand, we've got the riders trying to find traction everywhere. You probably got some sore legs from yesterday. So, kind of this first five minutes is heavy. It's on. It's off the bike. It's a quick start. You see Inga Vanderheiden starting to slide back from that st that from that start, being so being so young. The current uh, under 23 world champ. You know, she has that snap, but when when the uh, when the big heavy stuff comes. We saw it over in the uh, over in the U.S. when she was at the Waterloo World Cup. She just wasn't very happy in that in those deep, heavy mud conditions. So something that uh, that I think is is probably something that she's continuing to work on. So they uh, now down onto the sand, just on the uh, the side here of the lake. It's the European champion, uh, well into her stride in the, this one. Puck Peters there in the the green, blue, and orange colours. Shirin Van Androy is the second rider there in the green and white as well. You can see and, uh, Puck Peters well to the front here. There's Anik Van Alphen just going around there in the red, blue and black. So great start again from Anik. And on to these climbs. This is going to be a tough day. Opening lap here. If you are just joining us, welcome aboard. We are on the uh, Telenet Super Prestige Series Round 1 here in Gieten in the Netherlands. And uh, this leading group here they're so going through at the moment. So the team 185 riders, uh, Shirin and Lindy Van Anroy, are well up there. There's the two leaders. So Horst and uh, C Celine Del Carmen Alvarado. Alvarado, yesterday, Jeremy, when we see riders doubling up on a weekend, um, some, you know, Celine yesterday, it almost looked like she wasn't, didn't have that form of the week before, but clearly just saving the legs with uh, the objectives today, potentially. Potentially, yeah. I mean, the thing that I can tell you that's going on right now is Alvarado doesn't want to let Anna Marie Wurst to get to the front and and start to do her tempo again, right? She wants to make sure that she's she's dictating the pace on some of these sections, especially these types of sections where it's it's one line. There's one rut going through these sand turns, and Alvarado is saying like, "Hey, I want to dictate the pace, even though the pace is very high here in this first ten minutes." She doesn't want to like have a replay of what happened yesterday with Anna Marie 
worse, where Anna Marie Worst gets, you know, basically carte blanche to be able to go out off the front by herself. They need to, she needs to dictate the pace. They know Anna Marie likes to ride because they're taking notes about these riders. Like, what does this rider like to do? How does this rider like to go? Where can I slow them up? So I think that uh, there's quite a bit of, uh, there's a quite a bit of rivalry going on here, and you can see these two are, are for sure locked in for a good day of ba at battle, as we see men on backer back there having a great start as well, Marty. She is indeed. So backer, then uh, Van Androy, Kant, Sana Kant there, Ellen Van Loy, Inga van der Heiden. So we're starting to get some good gaps. You can see 7.45 on this one, so 29 seconds. So the end of uh, lap one, it's Alvarado that's just starting to push the pace on the uh, road section here over Anna Marie Hoer. So one second, then you've got Backer, Van Androy, Kant, Van Loy, Van der Heiden, Herker going through, Castellan and Peters just coming up here as well. So just uh, moving through, Laura Vadonjkot, then you've got Shirin Van Androy, Anik Van Alphen leading Alicia Maria Azufi here. And then Monique Van der Rey is the rider just behind that beautiful slow-mo here of the Eco Creelan rider, the world champion, Sana Kant. And you can see all tricked out in uh, rainbow bands. Celine Del Carmen Alvarado has a look back here, the Corridor Circus rider, just to see where Anna Marie Hurst is behind her. And, uh, Van Androy just trying to close this gap down. Sana Kant moves round man on backer. So still uh, gaps in cyclocross terms here. Jeremy still quite uh, still nice and tight here after the first lap yeah for sure but you can tell that the pace is super high it'll be interesting to see if we do get a small lull as we see Alvarado jumping off Anna Marie Worst jumping off and now this chase group coming on there's only a couple of seconds but we're we're not that far into the race we're only nine minutes in Marty <laughs> we are indeed Van Anroy leading that group there's Herta Hooker here's Puck Peters bunny hop specialist there she is, Puck Peters goes over, Annick Van Alphen behind her as well as another uh, another rider that bunny hops the barriers. She's uh, just behind our Zufi here, let's uh, see if she does it, lining up, and she does indeed. So second there we had Anna Kay yesterday, so there's Monique van der Rey, Los Cells, Katie Keo going through, and then Mount Captains, that is your order. Thanks for getting on board as well, uh, Miguel Inigres from the Dominican Republic. Thanks for uh, saying hi. And uh, a lot of you uh, just checking in over on there. Timothy Turin just checking in. Uh, MT Ishan from Mumbai in India. Thanks for uh, saying hi. Remember, let us know where you're watching us. We like to stick a very, uh, sort of uh, a pin in the map. Uh, Scott Larson from Minnesota, USA. Peter Thomas from uh, North Wales. Thanks all of you for getting on board. Here's our chasing group here, led by Sana Kantz. I tell you, what, the Shirin Van Anroy that's made it into that group in the green, white, green and white colours from Team 185. Jeremy, seven, as we said, we've seen her last week, 17 years old. You see her going around here on the wheel of, uh, of Sana Kant. Uh, we've seen her take European time trials, medals at the uh, in the World Junior Time Trial Championships. I'm really, really excited to see what the likes of her and Puck Peters that you can see there in the, the green, blue and orange colours, they're... they're very much the the future absolutely i mean i feel like we're watching the current generation with uh celine and anna marie right now you know they are now like heir apparent obviously we have some of the riders that have raced through the generations as you see right now sana khan the current world champion chasing down but really from a different generation than these two front riders uh, the younger riders that are coming up are starting to raise the bar the same way that we saw vanderpoel wow van Aert start to take it to a, well what i would call a veteran now in lars vanderhaar we're starting to see like these younger riders really make their mark and so being able to jump the barriers and push that level up it inspires everyone to get a higher level and so i think it's uh it's welcomed you know when i did this interview with lars vanderhaar recently he had said to me like yeah it doesn't matter how old someone is you just race the competition and i i took a lot away from that i was like you know what you're right it doesn't matter if someone's 35 or someone's 25 or, or 15 you just race you know you don't know how old they are but it is awesome to see them pushing the boundaries and really yeah just making making the women's side of the sport completely level like there's no difference now the women jump the men jump the women race for 50 minutes the men race for 60 like we're 
we're starting to get really close to the equalization of this sport, and um, I think that's a welcome change for everybody. It is indeed. Uh, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado takes the left line. You see her with her uh, European champion uh, Canyon bike as well. She's the European under-23 champion. You've got the uh, European elite champion right behind her, Anna-Marie Hurst, Sana Kant, going uh, high with the bike on that one. Let's have a replay of uh, this section here. Sana Kant on that run up there. Oh, Van Androoy goes down, Ooh. just clips the foot. And again, very, very uh, gloopy, very deep mud at the bottom of, of that. Uh, stair section there, Jeremy. That's that's always the danger, isn't it? Yeah, Van Enroy is going to need a, a, a extra massage, I think, from that one. That's going to sting. Um, but you know, in the race, the adrenaline will be going, and um, she won't have to she won't have to think much about that at the moment. But you know, a little bit later tonight, she's going to feel that one. That was a hard hit on that lower step. But Alvarado leading out here. Let's have a replay here. Namik Van Vluten. Just over the top of that, they're just uh, showing the replay of the World Road Champion. It's just uh, a, get, getting the remount nice there, um, Anamik. We and it's, again, it just shows the difference between... We, we, we had a lot of people talking about it yesterday, asking road riders that could transfer over to cyclocross. It is very difficult, isn't it? The skill set that you need as a cross rider when you've raced cross from a, from a young age and come all the way through, the sort of physiological benefits that cyclocross gives you when you transfer to the road when we, you know, is very different from that and the skills you need to be a top cyclocross rider. Yeah, I mean, we said it yesterday. It's uh, it's hard to come from the road to cyclocross, but as you can see from the year of road racing, you can see a lot of the cross riders are able to make it over to the road. The skills are more transferable in that direction than they are from road over to cyclocross. Cyclocross is very unique skill set, and you need to really have trained a lot for it, especially technically. Not you could get by with the like with your engine, you know what I mean? If, if I could use that word, I think it's. I think you could you could get by with fitness. How's that? It'd be a little bit better. But but the but the idea that you would have the technical prowess to be able to ride a rut going downhill in the mud, having not done it before, is uh, yeah, it's just not not really realistic. <laughs> So on this uh, opening lap, on oh, this uh, sec lap here, so Ellen Van Looy, oh, Van Looy uh, goes deep into the sand there, just loses it on the, uh, goes down to the right. I was just about to, I literally cursed the commentator before it even happened. I was just saying Ellen, I was about to say Ellen Van Looy's having, having a good start here, <laughs> the best no. one we've seen so Marty, far. You got to pipe it, man. You're, you're, you're cursing them. <laughs> 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 no, honestly, I've just, I, I, we'll, we'll just uh, tell you what, I'll, I'll stop cursing the riders. We'll, we'll just put on a little mellow jazz and just uh, come back at the end and let that one run. So, yeah, sorry, <laughs> Ellen. <laughs> she is having a fantastic ride. The, uh, the Belgian rider here, she's definitely a veteran of the sport. She is the, uh, she's probably raced against three or four generations at this point now. She's uh, always got a smile on her face, and it is great to see her here chase, leading that chase group. This seems like uh, she's on a great day. She is indeed here. She comes around towards the line. So at the end of lap two here for Alvarado, looking absolutely phenomenal again the Corinthian circus rider just you can see just drops off the end of the uh, the road section there back onto the uh, the dirt back to your chasing groups so of van loy Hurst, can't cast the line moves up van anroy van der heiden is the next rider you can see this gap already just uh, 15 and a half minutes of racing and the gap already out to uh, 21 seconds over uh, Del Carmen Alvarado. But Don Scott and Backer just come around the corner just behind. So Van Anroy not looking at too much, any worse aware for that, that little tumble that she took. So 33 seconds is the gap back to that chasing group here at the hooker there as well. Then Ava Lechner goes through. So uh, got a good start here as uh, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado in this position, Jeremy, when you get the, this has got to be the dream scenario, is it, for a, for a rider when you get out there against this level of competition and you can just concentrate on the lines you've worked in all the way through all your warm-up laps and just and just time trial your way. 
Yeah, I mean this chase group has got a lot, uh, a lot of power in it. So it's not a this, this definitely this isn't a battle that's uh, that's finished or completed at this point. Right now, it's about uh, Alvarado staying within herself and riding all of the lines that she knows. It's a very technical track, and there's a lot to think about here. It's a long race. This is we're only 15 minutes into it, so you know a third of the way into this race today. And um, yeah, these riders I think have a lot more, a lot more power, a lot of different like ideas about when they may go harder. Obviously giving Alvarado all of that distance right away might not have been possible to chase them down that that start Marty I think was just so fast and Alvarado has been able to keep the pace high we know from last weekend that she's on a good bit of form and as you can see there is quite a bit of daylight coming through right now but uh, you know what it's like one small error one crash one shifter in the sand and um, that that can diminish very quickly that's the thing when you when you look when on this sort of course 26 seconds we we see a rider go off very early in a race like this is there is there ever any discussion in a chasing group behind this when you say come on we we got to we got to get this together we just see Yara Castelline now attacking for uh, for triple 7 yeah i mean i think that there can be um Almost like a, I wouldn't say a give up, but we always say in the United States, it's out of sight, out of mind. And so if the rider that's winning is out of sight, that's always tough. You know, it's like you can't see them. So now that they're out of sight, it's like they're out of mind. And, and the, that makes it hard on these riders. It's a little bit of what Vanderpool has done to the men's field. You know, he's dem, you know, he's decimated the men's field so many times over that when, when he attacks, they almost don't react. They just sort of let it happen. And, um, that's not a good mental place for anyone to be in. I think it, it doesn't bring a lot of like, it doesn't make cyclocross the, the sport that it actually is, which we watch it for, which is all these great battles. Um, so yeah, so I think that someone like uh, Casterline is just really pushing the pace to be able to try to get her back in sight, hope that she makes an error, bring this time back down, and then get this uh, race restarted. There's the uh, the chasing groups. Thanks all of you for checking in on Facebook as well, Susanna Viles. I've got to do my contractual obligation apparently for the uh, I think it's the Brisbane Queensland Cyclocross Massive. I've got contractually obliged to give her a shout out now. Carlos uh, Alberto Villescas checking in from Colombia. Thanks for checking Tim Howcroft. Is Anna Kay riding today? No, she's not. Theda Ledwaba from South Africa. Thanks for saying hi as well. All of you from all over the world. So. Uh, Drew Anwil from Toronto in Canada as well. Peter Mullins, thanks for saying hi. Anna Sims from Singapore as well. So all of you watching from all over the world. Ashe uh, Sankpal as well from India. So thanks all of you for getting on board. Remember, spread the word. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a like. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to GCN Racing. We are here all winter long. This is the first of eight rounds of the Telenet Super Prestige Series. And we are here in Heaton. It's, it's very, very tough. Proper, as we would say, Jeremy, proper cyclocross conditions today. We didn't have a lot of them in Europe last winter. Yeah, I mean, this is proper cross. Anytime you're running with your bike when it's flat because it's too muddy, that is proper cyclocross as those riders have to push their weight really far back to be able to go down and get through those ruts so that they don't have too much weight on their front wheel, forcing them in a direction that they don't want to go. If they get their weight really far back off the back of the bike, then that front wheel is able to just sort of go where it needs to and find its way. Whereas if those riders are weighted up on the front of their bike, they're just going to go right over the handlebars. So I would expect throughout this, uh, this the course of this uh, broadcast today that we will unfortunately see a rider go over the bars as we get this long shot um, we can see uh, we can see in that last shot that the American rider Caitlin Keo was uh, was just off this chase group this big chase group Marty this this chase group is it has really grown there are a lot of riders very close together just behind Celine uh, del Carmen Alvarado I tell you what, I'm impressed by Manon Bakker here as well. Manon is uh, they're wearing 38 in the pink and white, and Anna Kay's teammate. So uh, she seems to be able to stay on the bike uh, on a lot of sections. Oh, rider down. Alvarado comes around. That's not what she needs as well. Rider down in the uh, there. Eniga Hydema and uh, Alvarado just didn't see her across the barrier there. Not what she wants. But again, Jeremy, that, it's racing, isn't it? It happens and. Uh, yeah, it delayed her by uh, by a few seconds. 
Yeah, doesn't gonna, not going to probably change the outcome of today. I'm sure it's uh, more embarrassing for the rider that was on the ground to be there, not able to get out of her pedal or whatever was going on. As we do get that shot of uh, the Cannondale CyclocrossWorld.com rider, Caitlin Keogh again. Just I was talking about her before. Nice to see her out there. But yeah, Alvarado is going to uh, going to unfortunately run into lapped traffic. Um, you know, no matter what, no matter what, at the pace that she's going at, she should probably be practicing just like everything else saying uh, on your left, on your right and <laughs> coming up and things like that so that the riders know. Yeah, I mean, you've got to, it's one of those things, a lot of the time, we don't see riders getting lapped a lot of the time, do we? Because they get they get pulled when they're going to be lapped, just to kind of avoid situations like that. But just sometimes a little tumble, someone's losing time and they lose time quickly on, on a course like today that's really, really super tough. And again, it's another thing you just saw Sana Kant do there. Riders you'll see just sometimes will just ride really, really close to the water as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the if it, it looks like it's pretty warm today. I didn't check the temperature yet, but I mean, everyone's riding in shorts and short sleeves, so it's definitely not cold. A lot of the, the men here that are just standing on the side that we can see there, they're just wearing like light jackets, so it's definitely not a cold, cold day. Hitting hitting that, uh, that water there might just be nice to get on the legs to kind of <laughs> get a little bit of your body temperature brought down. Do you want the weather report? I've got, you know me, I love a weather map. Um, it's, Let's it's, hear it. <laughs> it's 16 to 18 degrees Celsius today. It's 61 to 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Cloudy with a chance of rain about 3 o'clock. 18 to 23 kilometer an hour winds as well. And I'll, as Celine Del Carmen right. Alvarado goes through here, I'll explain the way the wind is coming across the circuit. So it's blowing as the riders go across the uh, the, the, the bottom down, down around that little hairpin before they come up round towards the, the start position. It's blowing across sort of their left shoulder across the sort of uh, start and uh, start finish. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, blowing straight across. So when we get winds like that, 20 uh, plus kilometers an hour, three laps to go, Yara Castelline and Sana Kant here coming uh, through the next two riders. So three to go. You can see at the bottom of your screen, 42 seconds is the gap from Alvarado to Castelline and Kant. Then Ellen Van Loy and uh, Van Androy. So Shiren Van Androy here wearing 34, goes through 54 seconds down. And Ava Lethner and Ant Manon Baca. C uh, Celine in these races so far, you, you mentioned Matthew Van Der Poel, uh, Jeremy. It's that kind of shock and awe kind of tactic, isn't it? Just really go really go for it super early and just see what see what everyone else has, has got today yeah i mean some of the riders yesterday you know one of those riders yara castellan who we see drilling it here on the front you know yesterday was also in the mix for second place um and faded just a little bit at the end as the battle heated up from for yesterday's final but uh as we're seeing uh, Annemiek Van Booten trying to find a line here through the mud and get herself going with a lot of encouragement from the fans on the sides. But but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, anyway, Caster Line is, is just having is having a heck of a season. Let's talk about that for a sec, Marty. Yeah, Caster Line is, yeah, Yara Caster Line for me is, you know, one of the, one of those riders that, again, like, each year we see these riders breaking through we saw Celine last year she took that breakthrough win in Brussels when she came through Yara Castelline 22 years old she's won uh, three national titles as a youngster so coming through if you, I think as well I don't know what you think but when you if you're in a country like Belgium or the Netherlands if you win the junior national title you're pretty much assured of breaking into those uh, breaking into those pro ranks and then you you see now with this triple seven team with Bart Bellens um, leading that you then get that experience that set up the the bikes the equipment everything that goes along with it and it can then just bring on and get, just sets you up for a good solid pro career absolutely absolutely couldn't agree with you more as we see the riders coming through this finally dry section of the course it's uh yeah, it's definitely one of those things where, we, well, let's talk about this too, Marty. The Sana, Sana Kant is now making her way. She's actually having the race. This is her best race of the season that we've seen so far. We do see, I mean, from what I see from her body language, she's going left and right. She definitely looks like she's burning some matches here, but I think it's important 
she's probably identified this as being an important day for her to really dig deep and to try to continue to build her form throughout the year. Definitely. I mean, she, as we said, she's won this series since 2015 overall. This this is her series. Last year, 102 points to Anamody Hoist to 96, so it was tight. This race uh, last year, you know, as well, Sana Kant was seventh in this one last year, 126 down on uh, Anamody Hoist. So she's won here in Heaton as well so in on three occasions. It was Hoist last year, Mount Captains the year before. Sana Kant won it between 2014 2016 Helen Wyman a uh, friend of the show has won it on a couple occasions as well and then Mariana Voss and Daphne Vandenbrand if we go back to 2009 but Kai Alvarado there just that dismount leans bumps into the bumps into the barriers as well and uh, you can see yep. the lines just getting a little bit rutted on uh, some of these really really muddy sections yeah, in the in cyclocross, it's not a, it's not it's not always about getting it, you know, making it look really beautiful. It just has to work. It's not a uh, it's not a sport that you can be like, oh, I didn't take that very very pretty. It's just sometimes you just got to kind of get the bike to keep moving forward. You have to kick your way along. You have to be able to throw it out in front of you, get off of it, run with it, and then get right back on. It's uh it's not always pretty, but it can be. It is the most efficient way to get the job done. As we now see Casterline uh, coming down this with her weight back, arms way out wide as she picks a line and we see the world champ Sana Kant right behind her as they come into this left hand turn where they're going to have to hop right off the bike. Oh, look at that mud. Look, look at the mud there. Ellen Van Loy there just banging the bars. Rob Winder just asking uh, Jeremy. Good question here. Question. Carrying pushing the bike which which is the best choice I'd say in this position. It seems odd to see people push the bike through mud and sand um, when the uh, surely there is more friction or is it to offset the energy taken to carry? Thanks Rob for your question. So, Yes. Yeah, so can you say that one more time, Marty? I, I, I did cut, missed you on this. So the one part question: of that. carrying or pushing the bike, which is the best choice? Given the, I'd say, given these uh, conditions, it seems yes. odd to see people push yes. through the mud or sand. Surely yes. they're more fiction, or is it offset the energy to carry the bike? Yeah, absolutely. As we see here, um, <clears throat> looks like. Uh, yeah, oh, man, that Van was a tough Loy. one to go down like that. That was why we were seeing that um, that shifter have to be fixed there. And you can see the riders are starting to struggle with this course as potentially the wind, Marty, is starting to make that mud thicker. So it could be a little bit more difficult. The course is changing a little bit. So do you run or do you push your bike through? Always a great, always a great question. But most times, especially in the mud, it's a lot better to be able to pick your bike up and throw it on your shoulder. Because why would you want to push your bike through mud? Not only is the bike getting more dirty, but it's also taking more energy to push this 15, 20 pound thing through mud. It's like dragging an, an anchor with you, right? Just throw that thing on your shoulder, put it up there, and then you run through, which is why, you know, over the years, almost, so many riders pick the thing up. If it's a very short effort, meaning you're just running up those stairs, you know, it's only going to be on your shoulder for two to three seconds before you have to put it back down doesn't make a lot of sense to get the bike up on your shoulder. The same with the barriers. Um, it doesn't make sense to, to put the bike up on your arm and get it over there if you're going to run through the barriers. Only when the runs are, let's say, 10, 15 seconds long, then it makes more sense. As we see Casterline now opening a little bit of daylight here between her and Sana Khan. It'll be interesting to see if this comes back together. Indeed, you can see these uh, two riders the battling the chase. You saw that beautiful aerial shot as well of Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, your leader, just picking up some of the back markers along the course. And you can see quite a lot of lap riders getting caught very quickly. How heavy this course is here in Heaton. So uh, thanks all of you for getting on board over on uh, social media. Thanks for all your chat. There's this battle for the podium. Yara Castelline, definitely breakthrough season. We're saying, uh, we would say here for Yara Castelline, moving up as well. And coming through, Del Carmen Alvarado, lap four. Drops you there, two laps to go. So two to go this time for Alvarado. The clock is ticking. And, uh, we see those small little uh, Errors that have crept in, but it hasn't made uh, really much difference to her advantage. Yara Castelline going through here, has a little look across just to see where Sana Kant is. Kant, the world champion, 
We're a few races in now, just starting to find her groove again. And it's great to see the world champion riding uh, so well here in this one. Castelline coming through. So two laps to go. We were 42. Ellen Van Loy, that heavy fall that she took from quite a height there. Ava Lechner coming back. So 48, uh, 49, it gets rounded up to, to cast the line. And then Sana Kant goes through. And we'll see that at 56. So those are the gaps back to those uh, chasers. And then a bit of a long shot back to this next group. But what a performance again from uh, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado. Ava Lechner here from Krefin has gradually ridden her way through the groups. Van Loy, Van Anroy, Backer with Don Scott. So 116 is the gap back to this next group. Manon Backer here from Expos of Foot Logics. Mount Captains this is coming up behind uh, Laura with Don Scott here. This is uh, still within your top 10. So Mount Captains sitting in eighth at the moment, uh, the former winner. Yeah, you saw Ellen Van Loy having a bit of a moment there with the bike as it went down there. She was having to bang that shifter to get it to be straight again. I think it's this is uh, the course today, Marty. Is 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 it's hard. It's you know this is proper cross, like we said. It's on. It's off the bike. It's a crash. You got to get back up. It tests the riders not just physically but also mentally because the course has got so many different variables that they're being it's throwing at the riders today. So. Definitely a true cyclocross course, meaning a complete rider, not just a road rider, not just a, you know, not just like someone that's good technically. It's going to take all of the variables today and throw them into account and to, uh, to, to crown the winner here at this race. A uh, good question here from uh, Giulini Bike, watching from Mexico. Just asking, do, you, do the riders use pro uh, regular cycling shoes, mountain bike shoes, carbon soles, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely mountain bike shoes, uh, no question about it. And today's race, they'll be using, uh, they'll also be using spikes in the front of their shoes, kind of like a soccer cleat, for instance. Um, it's really important that you get that traction and you kind of get those teeth in the front of it, so that you get that uh, when you when you put the push the front end of the shoe into the mud, that it's actually got something to bite onto. And so the the um, yeah, it's really important to have a lot of grip. So a mountain bike shoe and traditionally cyclocross. Uh, shoes also have those teeth in the front so that they can get traction because they're off their bike running with it so frequently. So the Corindon Circus rider Celine Del Carmen Alvarado just 21 years old is uh, Celine and uh, what a uh, couple of seasons that she has had. So taking that Brussels University cross, as we said at the beginning of the year, national champion in the uh, under 23. She was also the under 23 general classification winner here at the Super Prestige uh, Series last year. And, uh, came through again. That uh, has won uh, multiple uh, titles as well on that run up and just looking phenomenal again today it's uh, she's definitely been at the over the last couple of seasons just the she's just been a revelation hasn't she the way you just see the technique and going away each summer coming back each winter you know different skill sets been away working hard and uh, you know she's she's just you know one of the most exciting finds in cyclocross over the last few years yeah, she has a really unique story. I mean, um, yeah, following her, you know, following her Instagram, you can see that she she does seems like she goes back. Um, she goes back home often to, um, you know, she's obviously from the Netherlands now, but going back to the Dominican Republic, coming back to the Netherlands, going, you know, from where she's from, it's uh, got a really, yeah, she got a unique story, but she's definitely left her mark on cyclocross so far. And uh, I have to say, it is really, really cool to see her kind of develop. Last year, Marty, was it in Brussels that we saw her take one of pretty, a pretty, um, yeah, a, a pretty good win, I think. She won by yep. quite a bit at that new race in Brussels last year. And yeah, that was the first time that I remember saying like, okay, we were finally starting to see her really come into her own and have the confidence to be able to take a race really from the beginning, ride it pin to pin, meaning, you know, starting at the front and then finishing it off with the win. Um, those types of rides, they mean a lot in the off season as the riders develop mentally. They just start to think about it more and more like, ah, can I, you know, can I, can I potentially take on Sonic 
Pop, the world champion. Can I take on Anna Marie Worst? And then the answer is, yeah, I think I can. And then that goes into their training all summer. And then when they come in here in the winter, they've got an opportunity to really kind of put that to the test. And uh, we've seen Celine Del Carmen and Alvarado really this season making uh, making that all all that hard training worth it. It's a what when you look at that long shot there of, of Sana Camp, this mud today. I mean, it's you see her just trying to trying to almost trying to pick her uh, pick her foot uh, foot line through there, which is which is easier said than done. It's kind of almost lose a shoe mud again today. Yeah, it is very thick. You can tell, and it's gotten thicker maybe because of the wind, like you spoke about, Marty. Something that I wouldn't have known, but I, I do think that it's definitely they haven't had any precipitation that I can see. So as the wind hits that mud, and it just starts to thicken it up and make it thicker and thicker, and then it just throws the riders around even more. As we see this beautiful shot of Alvarado coming through. One thing I wanted to say is that uh, is that Sana Khan, I think, is having the ride of the season so far for her. You know, she's had she's had yesterday. We saw her drop out. We've not seen her feature on the podium yet and it does look like i said like she's really starting to kind of burn some matches here to try to get through as we see alvarado running into traffic again on your right she's going to be telling this rider coming through coming through that rider moves out of the way for her and she's able to stay on that line so yeah really really uh this section is it's only got one line through it is looking absolutely phenomenal here is uh celine del carmen alvarado so just coming up to fleur van der Peet. Here's the rider just in front of her, and a few of you just asking over on the on the YouTube forum why they're not pulling riders on the uh, on the 80 percent rule. I think sometimes the the way that she's riding here at the moment, our leader, she's just pull coming up on riders so quickly that they're not. Act I, it almost seems that like they're not able to pull them quick enough at the moment. Yeah, they might lose a lot of time in one section. You know, they may have uh, an eight-minute lead when they go through, but uh, but yeah, but then when when they make a mistake or they have a trouble in the sand section, you can lose a lot of time all or, all of a sudden. So we're seeing Anime Van Vluten calling it a day. Probably did get that 80% rule. So uh, yeah, awesome effort from the Road World Champ as we see now um, Yara Castellan and uh, and Sana Khan back together as they go in through those sand sections one to go last lap you can see at the bottom of your screen so celine del carmen alvarado again a phenomenal ride here from the coroner circus rider but the world champion though is battling hard with yara castelline for that important second place on the podium. Remember, this is a season-long competition. Points mean prizes. Sana Kat, the winner overall last year. You've got to be, again, Jeremy, you've got to be as cons If you want a competition overall, you've got to be super consistent throughout the season, haven't you? You do, and I think the thing is, is Marty, as you get older, you start to realize that literally the exact day, moment that you need to start to get ready for your season, none of the races that Sana Khan has done so far have really meant anything to her. And this is sort of the last moment that she could um, she could come on to form in order to have a good run at this uh, series overall. So taking second today is gonna that's gonna be fine. You know, that's not a that's a great that's a great result. It's about going all the way through February as these races do and her season isn't like a classic like american season where it starts you know in late august and it runs through february you can see that she really knows when to put her training around and to be ready for the second week in october this is what she's focused on and she's really been able to execute again on her plan she has years and years of data and in all of her training probably written down she's got coaches that probably pour over it and understand and she knows the exact day what she needs to do how she needs to do it to be able to get there and um it's just nice to be able to see her here at the front again you know being competitive because these last weekends i think uh yeah it was tough to see her like i said yesterday drop out of the race so there you go so alvarado can cast the line van loy and uh lechner You've got Captains, Van Androy, Van Scott. That's your top eight at the moment. So Sana Cat now comes through to the front. This last lap, the battle here between Yara Castelline and uh, Sana Cat into the planks for the final time. You can see the gap of minute and three seconds when they went through the line between this rider here from Corridor Circus. You'll recognize those team colors, the team colors of Matthew Van Der Poel. And putting in, you've got to say, it's you, you put in a similar performance today <laughs> she has for sure yeah she has that uh 
Yeah, it's a lot of time. I mean, I think that uh, I think that at some point, like I said before, the riders behind, we're thinking that now we're racing for second place. So we'll, we'll focus on racing for second place and ride within ourselves. Uh, Alvarado on an absolute tear here, um, usually getting a bit more um, yeah, getting a bit more competition from the other riders, but uh, she must just be on an absolutely phenomenal day. She is indeed. This uh, this shot here, the best shot in cyclocross, I think, the best camera, best camera angle in cyclocross. This cable cam that they string across the lake here in the Super Prestige series. If you are just uh, getting on board today, welcome here to GCN Racing, and uh, we are in Gieten today in the Netherlands. So a long drive for the riders who competed uh, yesterday. Uh, up here to this one, but uh, we're here in the Netherlands and it's a Dutch rider that is leading. We saw Annemiek van Vluten, the uh, the Dutch uh, world road champion for Mitchelton Scott. Uh, she started, she was still smiling when she finished despite the fairly brutal conditions today, but it has been a absolute top draw performance from uh, this rider today. She really is the superstar, the under 23 European champion. A lot of you uh, comment in on her bike uh, as this is the elite race she doesn't get to wear that european champions jersey that honor goes to anamari hurst who is the uh, the elite european champion but she rides that canyon uh, european bike and uh, just taking this uh, this course really uh, in her stride here and i gotta say jeremy this this section here is his has got to be one of the toughest on this course today this run-up Oh man, can you imagine? Can you imagine doing all that other stuff before this and then having to get off and run up? But it's, uh, like I said, it takes a super complete rider and someone with a lot of experience to be able to know how hard they can go before they've got to get off to make sure that they don't spike their heart rate and then get back on the bike and keep their momentum. But you can see that they're just trudging through. It's really deep. It's over their ankles, deep mud at that first part of that section. But she's got a great rhythm here and she's going to put the bike right down. As we see enemy Van Vluten sitting with the reporter just finishing up watching the races as, as the reporters are just in awe that the world road road champion is uh, is just chilling on the sides yelling for uh, yelling for the competition to keep going <laughs> that's that's brilliant that, as as and, that's whenever uh, uh, anime whenever she's super awesome is always her is always her thing she's again you got to you got to love that you know just I out do. there I think cheering that's fantastic. on those riders it is it's absolutely yeah. brilliant to have her here so this, this battle, battle, Marty, is really interesting, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, and I think, what do you think? Do you think that the young, you know, do you think the young Yara Kasser line or the, the experienced veteran of Sana Kant will take this? I, well, what do you think? For me, I think Castelline has to get away from Sana Kant. She has to try and get some gap. I think if it comes down to that sort of that sort of straight duking it out in a sprint, I think Sana Kant's probably got the power in the sprint over the two. Yeah, well, what I see right here is Sana Kant getting in the front before they get to the technical uh, sand sections, and she wants to lead through those because she knows from experience that if she's able to push it through here and she's able to keep Casterline just a little bit off that it's going to yo-yo her enough to get that gap. So as you can see, she's now starting to turn it a little bit up. You can see that she's starting to dig, try to look for time. Where can she start that pedal stroke just a little bit earlier? And it looks like Casterline's not able to immediately match the effort that Sana Kant is putting out. So Kant really starting to get into today's race. And I guarantee you, she's going to take a lot of momentum and positivity away from this effort here today. She is indeed. If you're here just joining us, so the final lap here, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, Anna Marie Juarez was looking good right at the beginning, but this rider here, she didn't want to let her go, battled hard with her, came through, had that gap of 33 seconds, built it steadily out to 42, then out to 56, and 103 was the gap back at the last count. But again, you can see here 431, Anna Flynn there. Sitting outside the top 20 at 5.01. Good to see the Brit up there still. Just outside the top 20. That's a solid ride there from uh, Anna Flynn. Uh, Peter's uh, dropping back to 25th. Shirin Van Androy's uh, drop back as well. That's Marley's Voss as well at 6.05. That's not Mariana Voss. 
Borowica, the Polish national champion, sitting there in 28th. But you can see what a tough day it is in this one. But Sana Kant here has pressed on with this one through the sand. Big attack now from the world's champion. Decides that she uh, wants to uh, press on with this one. Cast the line. So it's now a straight fight on this one. 46 minutes and uh, counting here on the, the final lap. And round into the home straight. Here is your winner. Cleans off the jersey. Celine Del Carmen Alvarado, the Dutch rider here for Coronet Circus, opens her account in this year's Super Prestige Series here in Eaton with a victory. Phenomenal performance by uh, Alvarado. Absolutely perfect day for her out there, Marty. She had literally so few mistakes and just the power to go with it. As we see Sanakant taking out her best, you know, I think her best performance that we've seen from her this season. Like I said, she's going to be so, so happy to be able to take this second place and, uh, and really kind of kick off the start of her season on the podium. And as we said last week, it just that coming into your season, a little bit of timing here and there. The, just to, takes a little bit just to find you, kind of find your groove. And that she's definitely done that. Here she comes into the home straight now. Sana Kant, as we said, in terms of where the world champion would be in her prep, nothing to worry about. Second place today pulls it back there to 50 seconds, just uh, crossing the line. So Sana Kant takes second Yara Kastelein is going to take third closely followed by a, a very fast closing Ava Lechner there so Lechner Van Loy comes in as well so a real charge by the Italian there behind Ella Van Loy took a bit of a tumble earlier on Mount Captains is your next rider in so Mount Captains at 123 so Mount is in sixth. Manon Backer, good finish by Backer. Then you've got Vadonshot and Van Anroy. So uh, Laura Vadonshot there. So eighth there. The uh, Vadonshot and Van Anroy. Looks almost like uh, Manon Backer didn't get a uh, didn't have a, a chip on there. So Van Anroy, and then this is here to Hooker. So they'll uh, double check that one. So here to Hooker here, crosses the line. And then uh, Alice Arz uh, Maria Arzufi comes in for, they saying 10th there. So Arzufi. But I make that at the moment because I don't think Manon Baca had a chip. Here's Anna Marie Hurst coming in for 12th place. What a ride. So just a 2.05 there. And again, Jeremy, just shows Celine Del Carmen Alvarado that final lap, the way you build, that you built that advantage, then just getting safely round that final lap. Yeah, you know, I think uh, she had quite a bit of time, uh, maybe even too much time. You know, I think maybe her, her coaches would say, hey, you probably didn't need that big of a buffer. It's great that you won as we see Inga Vanderheiden come through here, the under-23 world champion finishing up strong today in 12th. Um, you know, how much, how much do you need? In cyclocross, you know, 50 seconds to a minute is, uh, is quite a bit of time. Um, maybe better to, uh, to save it for another day and get an early recovery going and take the last lap a little easier um, would have been maybe my suggestion just because, you know, she had <laughs> built up such, such an effort already uh, that she had such a good lead, no reason to take any risks or to push it. So, yeah, uh, but needless to say, fantastic effort and as we see men on back are finishing there um just to see you go know, again uh all these riders out here today just just a hard day a hard day's work for everyone regardless so they've given their uh Annick van alphen coming in uh, they've put man on backer there in 13 uh, man on was a little bit higher up uh, in the standings than that one karen verheystraten here is uh, coming in next Annick Van Alphen, you saw just in front of her, 3.43 were the next riders uh, coming in. Stephanie Paul is that rider there in the uh, the black. Here's uh, Katie Keogh and, uh, coming in for Cannondale Cyclocrossworld.com. Tough day out there for Katie Keogh. 
Yeah, probably not exactly what she was expecting with 16th, but uh, she had a great race yesterday, and this is her first true weekend of cyclocross racing over in Europe, so no stress there. I think uh, they'll go back. The Stu, shout out to Stu Thorne, who's over there, my pal. He's in the pits with her. They're getting themselves uh, excited for a, a lot of bike racing that's going to be happening for her and that program over in Europe this year. It looks like Lindy Van Androy coming in next. So Lindy uh, crossing the line there for 18th. Martha Troyan coming in for Telenet Balwas Lions. So I make the top 10 at the moment. I'll take a correction. As we say, it's always provisional. But I make Alvarado, Kant, Castellan, Lechner, Van Loy, Captains, Backer, Vadonjgot, Van Androy, and Hooker at the moment. The top 10. 10 so uh, and then just outside that are Zufi, Hurst, Van der Heiden and uh, Low Cells so that's uh, the order good to see you again it's great when they uh, when they show so many of the riders uh, coming across the line uh, sometimes they they kind of just cut away uh, quite early on in uh, in some of these but uh, again the phenomenal performance but again uh, the course here in Heaton it, it it's I, I said at the beginning it's it's my it's my uh one of my favorite courses uh definitely oh, this one. probably not definitely. to ride though <laughs> <laughs> no it is it's so nice yeah i think all the riders think that as well of course it's a really long drive to the most northern part of uh of the netherlands and from yesterday's race like we said it's uh it's almost uh four hours if they did yesterday's race in mulebeka the polder cross which is part of the ethius cross that we called yesterday marty imagine a really muddy race that they had to compete in yesterday right where their bikes are trashed their clothing's trashed they've got to mechanics have to get everything cleaned up they have to take care of themselves get a massage eat something get a good night's sleep, and then get their, get themselves and all of their gear back four hours away to this most northern part of the Netherlands for a completely different show um, where, they have to, where they have to perform. So, yeah, a lot of work. Let's hear from Celine Del Carmen Alvarado. Yeah, I feel like it's super good. And I was actually brand on today to win, actually, because yesterday was just very slecht. Ook al drie ik derde, maar uh, ja, dat lukte. Dus, uh, ja. Hoe komt het dat je zo snel afstand hebt kunnen nemen? Um, ja, weet ik niet precies. Het, uh, ik reed achter Annemarie aan en ik voelde me vrij goed. Het ging ook vrij makkelijk. En uh, in uh, dus dat loopstuk, dat hele lange loopstuk, zeg maar, naar die laatste loopklim. Toen liep ik en de rest fietste. En zo um, reden Annemarie en ik weg. En op een gegeven moment uh, trok ik gewoon door op een uh, hey, goed gefeliciteerd, op een goed tempo. En ja, ze kon gewoon niet mee. Ik weet niet uh, wat er gebeurde en ik was los. Je hebt natuurlijk wel een heel stuk alleen voorop moeten rijden. Dat, is, dat lijkt gemakkelijk, maar dat is het allesbehalve. Nee, dat was het absoluut niet. Ik heb geprobeerd om elke ronde gewoon uh, zo gecontroleerd mogelijk te rijden zonder mezelf te branden. En uh, ja, als, ik, als ze in het einde bij me terug waren gekomen, dan had ik nog wat over, maar dat uh, reden ze niet. Dus ik kreeg gewoon lekker door. <laughs> en nog eens de bevestiging van die hele goede vorm die je hebt. Ja, absoluut. Zeker weten. Wat doet dat met je vertrouwen eigenlijk voor de volgende weken? Ja, dat geeft heel veel vertrouwen. Het uh, zegt ook dat mijn vorm gewoon nog steeds goed is en uh, dan dat ik hopelijk uh, zo lang mogelijk door kan trekken. Dankjewel. Nog eens dikke proficiat. Your winner there, Celine Del Carmen Alvarado. As I've said, I'm working on my, on my Dutch and my Flemish. Uh, it, it might take me a little bit of work this winter to get there, but I... I uh, I am working on that. Let's take you through. There's some pictures of the day. It was Inga van der Heiden that led off on this opening lap. Ellen van Looy, again, got a great start. Sana Camp, Man on Back of Puck Peters, Monique van der Rey, all up there at that point. There you can see Celine Del Carmen Alvarado. At the beginning, though, it looked like uh, Hurst and van der Heiden were going were gonna to be the, uh, the stars of the day. Hurst came through, and it then became a battle for supremacy at the front between these two riders. But Alvarado made a move. Hurst at this point looked like uh, she had the legs to go with her. Again, uh, man on backer there. You can just see in uh, Shinin Van Androy from uh, Team 185. She took a little tumble there, Van Androy, on the steps. But from here, it really was just all about one rider. Time trial her way round. Cleans the jersey off like a true pro uh, to sit up and take that victory salute. But uh, again, the the battle between uh, those uh, two uh, riders at the front early on jeremy it looked like uh, anna marie Hurst had the uh, she it looked like she had the form to go with her early on 
It did, it did. But then you can see in that later shot, it looked like maybe the legs just weren't reacting to the effort that they were being asked for after yesterday's pretty dominating performance. Maybe just burned one too many matches, went a little too deep on that fast track that we saw in Mula Becca. Came up a little short today. I know she was coming off of an illness. So yeah, that's how that's how it that's how it happens. It's bike racing. Some days are great and some days aren't so great. You'll look forward to the next one and you keep on moving. Yeah, okay, so just to leave you a little bit of uh, a heads up on what happens here. So the men's race, it's about 25 minutes away, so don't panic. We have a little half-time uh, show, and then we'll come back. we we'll do a little recap of the women's race as well, and the podiums. We'll come back with those, but the half-time here, Jeremy has been out. We've got a little cyclocross tech from the World Cups, and also we've got a little teaser to the featurette with Annabody Hurst. We will be back in a little while. So we're heading over to your training course where mm -hmm. I presume you do laps and yeah, maybe, are you training with other riders there? No, most, most of the time I train alone, but here and if I go to cycle training, then I go to with other riders. This is sweet, Anne-Marie. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Okay, I have to try to take time where I can. Oh. No. <laughs> so, now, you're racing, you're the European, current elite European women's champion. Mm -hmm. You obviously have some great stuff happen as a younger rider tons of success um, but now you're riding for a Belgian team uh, I'm gonna try to pronounce this Stalarts triple seven dot be and yeah. how would you say that because Stalarts say seven so I was close um, <laughs> I'm probably not but for us that's perfect so uh, and obviously I think that you've had such a big year last year I feel like winning the European Championships had to be an incredible feeling for mm -hmm. you um, yes Tell, tell me tell me about being you know being European champion and what that race was like I watched it yeah. personally and yeah it was a really exciting race um, I was going into because yeah I knew I could win a race but yes I yeah I knew I've never had to expect it that I can win it and um, yeah the race was really excited we were with I think six riders in front yes and it was really uh, fast score with cent uh, part cent and a forest and every lap I knew in the forest I could ride away there. And um, yeah, I think uh, one of the last laps I, I rode away in that sport and then I had I think, still one and a half lap to go and I knew the gap between the other riders was just 10 seconds, it was not really big, so I had to go, go full gas and uh, yeah, it was so, so nice to win the race. And what about coaching? Do you have a do you have a coach that you're working with? Yes, I since this summer I have a new coach. Uh, it's a Belgium uh, guy, yeah. Axel from uh, the team. Cool. So I have a new trainer. Very cool. <laughs> yes. And uh, and he, do you guys meet every like often? You guys see uh, each other and he's like no, he's yelling living, at you. Yeah. <laughs> Go, no, Anna Marie. <laughs> no, he's living in Belgium, so it's a little bit too far. But we have, uh, yeah, we're apping and we have uh, contact with telephone. We're calling. So. Yep. Every day we have contact, so. Excellent. What about like other training that you're doing? Are you doing like, because a lot of riders we're seeing are like in the gym, doing a lot of weight lifting. Yes. Um, also doing, of course, probably some running. Mm -hmm. um, maybe with and without the bike. Yes, now um, I'm, in the summer I just rode my, my road bike and mountain bike, but I think the last few months before the cycle season, I go to the gym and start with, yeah, weights. Yep. And, uh, and also then I start with running, but then just without the bike. I yes. do it uh, with the bike and with, on the cycles training, but with at home I just run without bike. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, yeah. And I you like can do it, it, but yeah. <laughs> and, do you, and do you like typically do like two workouts? Or are you doing something like morning, evening? Um, are you doing I like everything? I like to train in the morning. Yeah. And course. if I have to go to the gym or something, then I do it 
more in the morning and then in the in the evening to ride on the bike. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice for the legs. Mm -hmm. Like yes. to get the gym out Otherwise, of your legs. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you can't walk. <laughs> you know yeah. I mean? yeah. Exactly. And so, uh, where are the uh, where are the European Championships this year? Italy. Italy. But so I don't, uh, which place? I don't know. But in Italy. Oh no. Your yes. teammate, Arzufi's hometown. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh man, yes. that's gonna be, uh, she's <laughs> gonna be in like peak condition. Yes, I think so. You guys are gonna have to stop texting the week before, <laughs> yeah. I think. I think <laughs> no, it's a hard fight. No <laughs> conversation. No. no, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and your parents go to the races with you? Yeah. Like your, All your, time. your mom, you said, is on the start and finish? Yes. She's always there. My father is also there. He's just watching, but. And my mother is doing the start finish, but I'm happy that, that they are there every race. Yeah, that's like a lot of energy yeah. and strength mm -hmm. and confidence. And yeah. there's nothing like family. No, no, it's really <laughs> good. And uh, sometimes my sisters are also coming yeah. to watch. It's really nice. Yeah, that's right. But they you, <laughs> you're a twin. Yes. Yeah. They couldn't see the, the difference between the two. Because sometimes before the race, they go to my sister and say, Do you, don't you have to race? <laughs> but I'm already in the camper to yeah. warm up or something. Yeah. You had yes. like a really consistent season mm -hmm. last year. So I, I mean, you took some wins, which is great. Yeah. Um, you're European champion, so you have a jersey, yeah. which is awesome. Yes. Um, and I guess what uh, what are you thinking about for this season? I, I, I think that you have probably a lot of ambition to do something mm -hmm. different. But what is your what would you say was your thing that you'd like to work on the most? And what are you looking forward to the most this year? Uh, I think the things when I have to work on is I think the sandy uh, courses because I don't really can do that really good. But Yes, last season I was really much on the podium, also in the World Cup, but I never won one World Cup, so I really want to run, win a World Cup uh, next season. So cool. that's really, yes, my goal for the next season. So we're here in Waterloo, Wisconsin at Trek Factory headquarters for their Trek CXC Cup weekend. It's a big cyclocross festival. They've got tons of racing going on from little kids all the way up to the World Cup. It's going to be a good weekend. In the pits, though, there's a lot of new tech that I want to check out and give you guys a scoop on. Okay, so I'm here with Morgan from Challenge Tires and we saw you in the pits and we had to ask because you had a couple of backpacks on and I knew there had to be something cool in there. Can you tell us about what you have? Well, you, you made me dig it out and uh, well, this is gravel stuff at the cross race. Yes. But gravel, of course, is an evolution of the cyclocross. Yeah. Everything we learned in cross, now we're gonna carry to gravel and the beauty of it is that gravel, you get to play with all the sizes. So we have the first tubeless tubulars, handmade construction. Okay. Uh, this is the Strata Bianca 36. And so the tubeless tubular allows you, it's the first tubular that allows you to get a cut and plug the tire. Okay. And so we have fused this very light latex inner tube to the wall of the tubular. So if you do happen to get a cut, you know, in the Flint Hills of Kansas and the sealant. It's too big. It's too big for the sealant. You just plug it and ride it home. Keep going. You know, yeah. And then wow. you know, off you go. And so that's going to be music to the ears of the riders that are out there with, you know, big tires, but they, they obviously want this high end ride quality from a, you know, a tubular, yeah. but to be able to be able to patch it like that, I think is, is going to be, is going to be well received. This is the, the cat's meow. This is the, you know, has to be. So great. Do you think that we're going to see this technology trickle down to the cyclocross tires? <sighs> well, we, we actually made a batch like a couple years ago, but they just didn't see, you know, cause you're going around and you know, you can ride a flat if you get to the pit, you know, and then change it out. Yeah. And there's just a little, little loss of suppleness yeah. that the, the cross people just have to have that. I know. <laughs> the ultimate, the ultimate, you know? I know. So, and the pit's right there, yeah. so. Well, thank you so much for showing us this. It looks really nice. And uh, yeah, thank you again for your time. Thank you. Okay. okay. More cool tech from the pits here at the CXC Cup. Mike Berry, mechanic for Cannondale Cyclocross World.com. 
talk to us about these pressure guns that you guys are using. So these are uh, Craftsman pressure guns. Um, they, we use all the same one. Um, we assign them to different riders. Uh, we don't necessarily need to worry too much about whether the pressure is exactly accurate or not, as long as every rider uses the proper gun. 25 pounds, whether it's 25 pounds in this gun, is always the same. I got it. Yeah, because that's why you guys each, uh, Kaylin Keo has her own gun. Stephen Hyde and Curtis White, they have their own gun. The other riders, you guys have other riders on the team yep. and on your development team. Yep. That all use a particular gun every time they go to use it. I love it. And so this, this originally, it was designed to be something that was used out on the road with your car tire. Automotive, it was designed for, uh, for straighter valves and it was designed for uh, balls and footballs and things like that. Yeah, and you have, you know, a lot of the pro teams re-engineer these guns to be able to put a, uh, a Presta valve on them and then to be able to fill these tires up super quick. Yep, absolutely. And and it's accurate. Uh, it, the digital gauge is great. You don't have to deal with the dial. Yeah. Um, and they go up to, uh, they do tenths, tenths of a pound. Yeah, exactly. And you don't need to worry because like, again, it's not about if it's uh, 25 pounds on this one. It's just the most important thing is that it's the same every single time on that gun. If that's what you think 25 pounds is, that's, that's what we want to make. As, as a former pro rider, I, I could appreciate that we use the same gun every single time. Yeah, cool. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you. We're over at the SRAM booth and I ran into Dan. Dan, tell us about what's going on with these cranks. This is unique because you guys have a lot of athletes running one by systems yep. with a power meter and it's different than your road setup. Sure, uh, with ETAP access, traditionally when you have a red crank set, the chain ring is all machined out of one piece aluminum. So with cross, typically it's the one by setup. So every crank, both forest and red, is ready to go with power or without. So this crank here, we're shown single chain ring without a cork power meter. If you want to run power, all you do is grab a spider, run a four bolt chain ring, and go one by or two by, and it's it's all power metering integrated into it. Wow. That is that is really cool, and I think I think for people that are out there with a two by, want to go to a one by, they're able to do that as well. Super easy, eight bolts, and you get to there. Ready? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm here with John at Shimano, and we're looking at the new GRX group set. This is uh, this is new for you guys. Can you tell me a little bit about what's going on here? And, and in particular, I'm really interested in these buttons that shift on each side and the tops. <laughs> yeah, um, so Shimano wanted to release a uh, gravel-specific uh, group set, so something a little bit more robust um, for gravel and cycle cross use. Um, so a nice feature are those buttons right here on top, just to give you another position to, to shift in. Um, so it's just a nice, comfortable place. You can use your thumbs, go up or down the cassette, you know, however, however you like. Cool. All right, well, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much for showing us. Yeah, yeah, thank you for coming by. All right, so we're continuing to look at cool stuff that we've seen here at the Trek CXC Cup, and I found Andrew. Andrew, tell us what the heck is going on with these. Yeah, so um, this is a, a PVC bike holder that we have here, and, and the idea is to uh, be able to fit four bikes in the back of our van here, which we use as our team vehicle, um, in order to keep everything organized and upright and clean and safe, um, and to maximize the storage space in the back of our small van. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. I mean, if uh, if I'm thinking about it, when I used to drive around in my old school Caprice, we used to just have to ram those bikes in there, and, and unfortunately, they would chip up the paint and get some things messed up. This is a, uh, a pretty, uh, yeah, a lot of ingenuity going into this <laughs> and, and the Thanks, ability. Jeremy. Yeah, you've just taken really what I don't know how much, but maybe ten dollars of PVC pipe. You've kind of created a jig and then you've replicated. It. You've got four of them in there and it, and it keeps everything super clean. I, I assume the wheels can tuck in between each of them. The wheels can tuck in between each of them and um, you know, they all fit together nice and they're they're cut to fit in the van, so everything fits in there really neatly, um, leaves just the right amount of space for everything and keeps it from falling over and, and moving around and uh, the bikes stay out of the elements as well. Can, can people pick these up at your local sponsor at the Pony Shop up in Chicago? Can people pick these up? Unfortunately not. People are going to have to uh, you look know, you up on the Etsy. They're going to have to look me up on Etsy or uh, <laughs> use a little elbow grease. But I think <laughs> I think these are very much within the ability of any, uh, you know, master carpenter, master carpenter. I could not do this. <laughs> Thank you. I, These look amazing. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay. Mike has a beautiful setup here at the SRAM booth. Talk to us about your uh, talk to us about your toolbox and this rapid charging station that you have. Yeah, so the toolbox I custom made. Uh, we have some red carbon fiber pieces built into it. Uh, I 
also have solar power uh, battery chargers that are built into the bottom of it. Okay. Uh, with some charger cradles that are here. Uh, but we also have for these bigger events the need for more charging to be done at once. Uh, so we've created a box that's a travel box, plugs directly in, and now we can charge up to eight batteries at one time. Uh, we've also got a USB because there's always somebody who wants to uh, charge your phone at some point. Um, but yeah, that's uh, everything you see here is just custom made with uh, red carbon fiber underneath it. Have to be SRAM red to match up. So if something is missing, we know exactly what's missing. I love it. Yeah, changing the times. It used to be housing and cables and all this extra stuff, and now you guys are going electric. Everything yeah. has to be electrified, and so having these solutions to be able to uh, to be able to kind of meet the demands of what's going on here. Portable energy. It's got to yeah. be a huge part of your life now. Absolutely. And I'll even carry a, a solar panel. Not on days like today where it's really rainy and uh, overcast, but the solar panel will actually charge up enough to keep up with it. I love the ingenuity. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we moved over to the feedback tent and we met up with Jeff. Jeff, you have your uh, your chain keeper here. You've even got a custom edition for the Trek CXC Cup. We talk, did. Talk to us. Yeah, this is such a great event for us and we love coming out here and racing and, and participating in the expo. So we decided to make a co-branded Feedback Sports Trek version of our chain keeper that works for both through axles and QR. Awesome. And this is something that can literally, like if I have a bike that's, um, like you said, through axle or regular, just quick release, yep. this goes on and it tensions the chain and allows me to like clean my bike or store it or rack it or whatever. Traveling too. A lot of people like to take their, obviously their wheels off in their travel bag and this keeps tension on the chain so it's not slapping around the chain safe. Yeah, very cool. All right, thank you so much. You bet, thanks for stopping by. Okay, so we ran over to the stands tent and they were packing up, but we got a glimpse of a new tire. And Drew, tell us about what's going on with this. Uh, so we've got a, a prototype mud tire from Maxxis. Uh, we do a little bit of modification to it, so there are um, uh, kind of a wide center knob that we trim up a little bit so that it sheds mud a little better. Um, it's what the girls prefer. Uh, hopefully we won't have to use it tomorrow. We'll see what the weather does, though. It's looking pretty rainy out there. It's a, a working prototype for sure, and obviously it's a, it's a tubeless design, so a lot a lot of riders we've seen doing tubulars, but stands obviously known for being uh, tubeless and your technology that you have there. This is, a, I believe, a patented rim as well. It is, it is. We've got five different patents on our rim shape. Uh, it's kind of our whole deal is the, the tubeless. We've been running the cross team for a number of years, so we're, we're happy to support athletes and, and be a part of the sport. And yeah. We're excited about uh, the World Cup tomorrow. What What is the lowest pressure do you think you can get away with on a tire like this, prototype or not? Just in, just curious. I think that's. Uh, we run in well into the low teens. Uh, I think the lowest course he ran last year was something like 13, 14. Wow. So, yeah, we wow. low. It's come a long way. <laughs> so cool to see. All right, well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. So that's all the tech from the Waterloo World Cup here at Trek HQ. It's a fun time for me. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you like this, please give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment below. Let us know what you like the most. And um, if you want to subscribe to GCN, please click right here. Hello, welcome back to the Super Prestige here in Keaton today. Not far away from the elite men's race now. Half time between the elite women and the elite men. So we thought we'd uh, you'd like to see what Jeremy's been up to. Great interview with Anna Marie Hurst and a little bit of tech from the World Cup just to let you know what's out there um, in cyclocross technology. At the moment, this race though in Keaton last year, it was the big man himself that took the victory. Let's remind ourselves of what happened. So, as we said, Matthew van der Poel last year taking the victory. He's not here yet. He hasn't started his uh, cyclocross uh, season as of yet. We had a great women's race. If you don't want to know uh, what happened there, then you can look away in uh, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And uh, the elite women's race, it was Celine Del Calman Alvarado that took the victory in that one. A great race ahead of the world champion, uh, Sana Kant and Yara Castelline. On to the elite men, though. Jeremy Powers is uh, back with me. Jeremy, looking at the course and the way it was riding in the uh, elite women's race, it's going to be a tough hour of racing out there for the elite men. 
Yeah, the elite men's race is going to be a uh, full-on affair. There's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of speed, and these ruts have uh, have gotten very, very deep. The mud has gotten thicker and thicker from all of the wind that we've seen out in the course, and you can see it's at, towards the end of the women's race, Marty. We were seeing the riders get thrown around a little bit, more crashes as they got more fatigued, and that those lines started to change, and that mud started to thicken up. So I uh, I expect nothing short of an awesome day today out there for the men's race. So looking at the course of this weekend, as we said, it's a pretty long drive from yesterday up here today to the Netherlands. And we had the arrival, the start of the season yesterday uh, for Tom Pidcock from Trinity Racing. And he, he was saying on social media overnight, he, he was pretty happy with, with that start to the season. Yeah, like uh, like we were saying during yesterday's uh, live commentary was that, you know, it's his first race out. So getting into the pedals, getting out of the pedals, getting those fast accelerations, getting that uh, that feel for the cyclocross bike and that low pressure in the tires and on and off and those high speed dismounts, all of that stuff for Pitcock is going to be just coming back to him having been injured before the road world championships, which were in his uh, home country. He put a lot of energy into that, did a lot of big miles, I presume, to be able to get ready for that race, came down was very close i believe uh you know finished on the podium i believe uh in third place i could be totally wrong on that but i believe he was on the podium there in third place and um yeah just a really really great to see him now focusing back on cyclocross and combining the two because the the idea that a uh, road rider can't do cyclocross cyclocross or can't do road those are completely thrown out the window wow van air uh and uh, a bunch of cyclocross riders vanderpoel of course all of these riders have ripped up the script thrown that out you can do whatever you want you can race as much as you want and whatever disciplines you want so that's uh the new the new generation has uh, has got us going for that. In terms of the difference between the uh, the courses at Kruibeka and Gita today, very different. Let's have a look at the uh, start list. Let's uh, take a look at who we're going to be watching uh, in this one. Tone Arts, uh, the Belgian champion, he's got to be he's got to be a big favourite for for this one as as well today. Yeah, yesterday we saw uh, we saw him do uh, you know a pretty good ride. I think he was. Uh, I think he's been like like I said about Sonicon earlier. I think that someone like Tunerits is really trying to time their season correctly. He's had he's been very consistent, uh, but he just hasn't had the ability to win yet. He hasn't won uh, you know a big race. He got second at the World Cups. He's been second in those other races. We've seen the other riders that we're seeing here: Van Torenhout, Sweek, um, all have taken wins, as has Eli Easterbeet, but Tunerits has been second quite a few times so i'm sure he'll be looking to go through it today um do you want me to start it up marty or do you want to take this one yeah you can tell, oh. i've got to look today michael van toren how is uh looking good you can just see the riders here just going through the final parts of uh of their warm-up yeah michael van toren how again he's been looking good but really the the man of the first part of the season is uh has got to be uh ellie east a bit and we just see sven nace here just with a uh, corny van kessel just uh, going through having a little final chat <laughs> taking a taking his hand and putting it on the tires to see what he's got and what is your tire pressure he's saying well i think i was running it soft but sven's saying well let me just take a hand and put it on there and check it out as we see a shot of Ely easterbeat looking down at these mud tires you've got quite a quite a selection of different brands from the riders especially towards the back some of these riders are going to only have a you know one or two wheel sets to choose from so as you get a picture here of tune air it's with the uh Custom Oakleys with the Belgian flag all over them. Ely Easterby taking one last yawn as the uh, as the nerves start to rise. We've got Corne Van Kessel from the Netherlands. We've got Quinten Hermans from Belgium, who was third place yesterday in the Ethias Cross. We've got uh, Lauren Swick taking, I believe, already five wins this season. We'll be looking for something today. Toon Ertz, the Belgian champion with those custom Oakleys. We've got Yanni Vermeersch coming off some great rides and some victories here in the United States, showing those Dugas Rhino tires. We've got, looks like a, a traditional Grifo tread here for Michael Van Torenhout. It's going to be interesting uh, tire selection. We've got Lars Vanderhaar, and then we have Ely Isterbit. What is he running? Looks like he's also on that, uh, that Typhoon. Uh, mud tire today so seeing majority of the tires out there are mud tires a couple of the riders are saying you know what i'm going to go with a little bit less tread because for those sections that are muddy i'm going to end up running them anyways ellie is a bit the man of the moment 
So you would say and he's lucky he's come into this season. It's looking like an absolute monster so far. He's uh, really been uh, crushing it. Yesterday, those big banks that we had in Kruibicker and the uh, the sand dunes that we've got today will give us very different racing. Lars uh, van der Haaye there. You can just see crouched, poised and uh, ready for this one. The riders just watching the lights. We're just about to get the race underway here. The elite men and the lights go green and we are off and uh, racing. So straight down the, the center of the road there as uh, Swake just gets a good start there. Van der Hart gets that whole shot through that first corner. Ryder goes down there on the uh, inside. So here Jan Vossman goes down, just delays everyone behind. Uh, Vermeersch through to the front for that Krefin team. There's Lars Bohm in the orange just in front of Marcel Meiss and Tom Pitcock as well. Just uh, maybe a little bit further down than he would want to be. Pitcock just on the inside. Just some riders getting delayed behind there. But uh, Vermeersch, Van der Haar, Swake, Hermans, Isabit, Joris Neuvenhaus as well in the colours of Team Sunweb. Those red and white colours are quite close up there. I was just thinking as I as I was going through the start list uh, this morning, Jeremy, hadn't seen Joris Neuvenhaus yet so far this season, and here he is. Yeah, he we did. We saw him over in the uh, over in the U.S. racing on that custom Cervelo cyclocross bike that I'm hoping to get a look at um, when I'm over there for the Koppenberg and Rudervorder races. Um, but yeah, as you see, Pitcock with that new Red Bull helmet that he just got, uh, Marcel Meissen along with the rest of the gang. It's definitely uh, this is uh, this race is off to a hot start. Yanni Vermeersch taking it out at the start. Like I said, he had taken some wins when he was here in the United States, and um, he's on a great tear of form. I had a chance to interview him after he won the category one race in iowa city and um he has just said that he had a fantastic uh, a fantastic spring and summer he was able to get a lot of good road racing in no illnesses no injuries and he was just in great spirits so i expect to see good things from him this year and um looks like he's already on a great day here he's recovered from that american trip that he had he has indeed. So, uh, Lars Bohm just trying to move up a little bit. Just run you down through some of your other riders. So, uh, as you said, Neuvenhaus there, um, Tom Meyerson, Ryan Christensen as well. Watch out for him wearing 22 in the blue of uh, Canyon DHB. Along with Tom Pidcock, you've got Ben Turner and uh, Ben Tullett are in there as well. Craig Gow wearing 60. And then you have Callum McLeod, Finn Mansfield and Cameron Mason. Those are your uh, riders. So just a few, just again, just running wide here on the opening lap. Though so there's the, again, those Canyon DHB colours, the blue jerseys. Uh, Callum McLeod also in that blue jersey. Vermeersch getting a storming start here for Kreofin. Yeah, I have to say he looks really, really strong. And Vanderhaar is pulling up right behind him. And in, in again, just like we saw last weekend, Vanderhaar with a very good start, very snappy, right off the line, right into the pedals, and he's able to take it. You know, he was saying uh, to me that these races never lull anymore. And that's the thing that makes him so difficult is that the pace stays so high. It used to be that the races would do one or two hard laps. And then for two laps, it would settle in a little bit and the group would come back together. And now it's just full gas the entire time as the riders get off and run up these stairs. And we do see uh, Toon Ertz able to take that line, like I had said, on that right-hand side to get a couple extra pedal strokes in. What do we got here? Oh, Marcel Meissen trying to go into a space that's not really quite the net. that typhoon, that less tread on that tire. Not going to have the same amount of success in, in being able to ride something like that. Yanni Vermeer saying, I'm picking the mud tire. So As well to see was uh, Lars van der Haar deciding on that opening lap to, to run the planks rather than, than bunny hop them because he had a bit of a tumble last week. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably just, uh, you know, you just remind yourself, like, yeah, on the first lap, I'm not going to try. I'm just going too hard. The heart rate's too high. There's too much adrenaline. It's uh, it's too stressful. So, yeah, I know I can stay in the front, and I just get off and run them. It's, uh, yeah, every rider has to do that. I mean, if I, if I got to a section that I knew I wasn't great at, but I knew I could 100% run it and lose a half of a second, well, then the safe bet is that I just get off and I just run through. So, yeah, I think it's um, it's one of those things that you just, it's a calculated risk. If you can't do it 10 out of 10 times, then you run it. So Van Kessel gets up there. There's Tone Arts. There's Tom Pidcock just uh, going through your picture there. Mia Houston, Lars Bohm getting a, getting a great start as well. So, uh, Turner. 
as As the team manager uh, of the Pau Sales and Bingo team. The Uriela leader now, Laurent Swake from Pau Sales and Bingo, just uh, through to the front. Rides the sand really well, um, does Laurent Swake. Yeah, it looks like the precipitation has helped the sand become very packed down. This section in the past has been has been a little looser, um, but this time is is quite uh, is quite packed in, and these ruts are really slamming. They just take the riders straight through the turn. As we see, Lauren Sweet super super focused right here coming through, and um, yeah, we've got now Lars Vanderhaar, Eli Easterbeet, maybe a little let wait to warm the legs up a little bit from yesterday's effort. Looked like it was a really big day for him yesterday. Probably had to put in. Quite a bit of effort to be able to take the win. And Lauren Sweet has said, hey, no problem. You know what, Eli? I'll take over for today. You just sit back and, uh, and enjoy the show a little bit. Yeah, Donuts, Jens Adams, the, your top 10. Gianni Van Miersch now, after that fast start, is down in uh, 10. Tom Pidcock there, Stephen Valters, Tom Mayusen. And uh, there you go, Gianni Van Miersch is showing now. 17, so coming around for the end of this Opening lap, Laurent Swake looks back at Quentin Hermans, Joran Neuvenhaus and uh, Ellie Easterbeet with Lars van der Haas. The gap's quite tight, so running you through your top ten. So Swake, Hermans, Neuvenhaus, Easterbeet, van der Haar, Van Kessel, Suter, Van Toren out, Arts, uh, Jens Adams, then Tom Pidcock going through. So Pidcock just there, Stephen Valters, Tom and Lars Bohm, Ben Turner, Gianni Vermeersch now back in 13, David Van Der Poel, Stan Godry getting up there as well. So uh, Kyle Achterberg, it's a good start from Kyle Achterberg there. So Timo Kielek going through there for uh, in 22nd. So Pidcock and uh, Turner for British fans, both well up there at the moment. It's nice to see a good start out of Lars Boom. I mean, you know, just outside that top 10, but um, I'd say that's the best start that we've seen from him. And uh, this, definitely this season, you know, the former world champ uh, in cyclocross, you know, always has a lot of style, but coming back into it, as we see these riders jumping the barriers in, in almost like it's a uh, almost like it's a music shoot. They're just doing it absolutely instinct and perfectly. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's. But anyway, great to see uh, great to see Lars Boom coming back into the sport and really trying to make a mark and and uh, and have some success with it. As we see him get off the bike there, probably a little rusty on barrier jumping. Wasn't something that was uh, necessary when he was the world champion back in I believe 2000 and, uh, 2010 um, for that season. Wasn't necessary then, but now is almost the status quo, Marty. Yeah, I mean, it changed. It, it, cha it was like a, the course of a season, wasn't it, where it changed and it became, you know, f changed from being something you did if you wanted to, to, to almost, be, yeah, it, it became a necessity, didn't it? And and now it's got to that point where you see the likes of Vanderpool, Pidcock, all these riders that come in and riders not even, they don't even check their speed anymore. It, it ju they just pop it up over the barriers. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's true. I mean, <laughs> even when I was racing it, you know, like as I got older, the younger riders were willing to take more risk and go through them faster. I remember trying to follow Vanderpool at the uh, at the World Cups, maybe 2016, uh, that when they were here in the States. And um, I came in, as we see two nerds getting a bike, I came into the planks with Vanderpool and just right there, he put three to four seconds into me jumping the barriers. So, yeah, these riders have an insane uh, amount of technical prowess that really has allowed them to take more and more time out of, you know, the previous generations uh, just overall. So, yeah, it's great to see the sport, the level is all coming up and it's a, uh, an evolution and the, the, the sport will continue to evolve uh, as the years go on. Quentin Hermans now the leader. It's shifting backwards and forwards. Pidcock just trying to battle on to the back of Tone Arts, who's just ahead of him here. I think what's uh, uh, been interesting, and uh, the few of you chat, uh, discussing over on the YouTube chat as well, no Matthew Vanderpool uh, here. Matthew Vanderpool taking a break after the road season. is going to come back in in a couple of weeks. Wat van Aert, of course, recovering still from that crash in the Tour de France. But Jeremy over the line. Oh, Tom Pidcock goes down again. We saw that with uh, Shea in Van Anroy in the in the women's race he's quickly back up and uh, and on his feet but we're seeing how quickly the, the lead just changing hands here we're, we're getting a little bit more bunch racing yeah it's great to see I love this type of racing and I think the fans will too as we see some riders again Eli Easterby trying to take that right line very wet nasty 
thick mud, but he's got those mud tires on, so he's able to just take one second away and not have to get off the bike as he makes it through that little section. His teammate there, Michael Van Turnout, just giving him a little push to keep him moving up as we see Vanderhaar trying to come through Toon Ertz and Pidcock, all riders that were in the yesterday's race, trying to get through. It's a... Uh, you know, it's a very hard course. I'd say Pidcock here we see kind of just having a little slip there. Not not necessarily that hard of a fall. You know, the worst part of that for him is just going to be that his hand is muddy, that he's got to put it on the bars now. And, um, and yeah, that's going to be the worst part of it. As we see, ooh, a nice springer. Needed to get that bike a little higher and unfortunately clipped the barrier there. But, uh, again, no 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 problem. He'll be, on, he'll be on his way very shortly. Didn't quite get the dismount right there on uh, that one so uh, you can see the, <laughs> the mud here so Joris Neuvenhaus from Team Sunweb riding there in second wheel Ellie uh, East a bit well up there Laurence uh, Swake very much to the front Michael Tfantor and out got the uh, it just kind of was almost like a little uh, balance correction Jens Adams is back there but telling that foul was lying so good to see the Team Sunweb man getting himself up here so as you were saying Jeremy that uh, that Savella cross bike he was riding on kind of blank bikes last year Yes, but apparently it is in fact a real Cervelo manufactured in-house uh, bike, although I don't know that. That is what he said on his Instagram. Um, so it's awesome to see him having some success. You know, very successful rider. And now he's actually taken the lead of the race from Quinton Hermans. Eli Easterby in the uh, back there lurking as he's warmed up his legs from yesterday. But Neuvenhaus is, uh, yeah, like a cl he's a class rider, former uh, world champ, and now he's out here just absolutely tearing it up. And it's great to see because because, yeah, we need to see more different teams at the front. We have two massive teams right now, Telen Telenet Balawaza and the Marlux Bingo team coming together to form a su two super teams with a majority of the riders under their banners. So it's just great to be able to see Joris Neuvenhaus kind of put things together, come out here and to uh, be leading this race right now. It's, it's, I think it's great. It's great. It's good to see the arrival of Trinity Racing as well. Tom Pidcock's team. Tonart's just on the back of there. Pidcock just trying to battle his way back here. The British rider, he made his uh, debut this season. Uh, Apologies if uh, you get the... Uh, the announcer in the background there, but Joris Neuvenhaus comes through, getting to the front east a bit. So the Pau South and Bingo riders are all uh, just massing behind the team Sunweb man at the moment. Round at the end of lap two, and still a really sizable group here, Jeremy, being led by Joris Neuvenhaus. Yeah, it is a big group, and um, it's awesome to see. I mean, these laps are absolute scorchers. We're seeing them come through at about 12.55, which means that, uh, that you know, these laps are six and a six and change six and a half minutes which is very very fast but you can see after the top 10 there is some gap forming and Pitcock's that next rider at 11th then Yanni Vermeers coming in 12th it's a it's a super fast race there we are Sven Nice just looking over his uh looking over his team riders trying to teach trying to trying to learn something trying to maybe give a little bit of advice to Quinton Hermans or to Lars Vanderhaar who's up there Toon Ertz just say hey this is what's going on. This is what we need to be thinking about. Maybe try this line, stay wide, stay inside. Um, always out there, keeping a watchful eye as the course conditions change. Just seeing the cameras hit, looking at the British national champion, the world under 23 uh, cyclocross champion, Tom Pidcock finding his way back, Dan Suter, Joris Neuvenhaus, Michael Van Turenau, Ellie Isabit, Laurent Swake, Corny Van Kessel and Quentin Hermans, the next group. Uh, Tone Arts, Jens Adams and Lars van der Haar coming around next, chased close by Pidcock, who lines up for the planks. Nice uh, smooth bunny hopping as you would expect from uh, Tom Pidcock, just trying to find his way back up towards uh, this group just ahead of him. As we see them rip down this section, this is probably the fastest like roller coastery section. You see most of the riders taking that left line, the right line maybe just a little too sandy, but it's very well packed down as we see again now Don so coming to the front, leading this race out. It's great to see these riders here, again, at such a prestigious series, the Super Prestige, this opening round. There's a lot on the line for these riders. Everyone has maybe let off a little bit yesterday to be able to bring 100% today, and that's the reason that we're seeing such close racing. Some people spent those matches yesterday, and now they've decided, like some of the riders that held back a little bit, they've got a little bit more. So as we see these consecutive days of racing, as we get into this full cross season, 
Um, we've got a, a, a course that's a proper cyclocross race, and, um, and it is now time to show their hands. So as we see Lauren Sweet coming in, taking a bike, and coming through that turn, it's almost better to maybe go in the pit on that section. You've got a bit of a straighter line as we see that bottleneck from, uh, from earlier. There's quite a few crashes there. But as you come out of the pit, Marty, it looks like it's just a straight shot right through that turn. And again, as it, for anyone that's watching cyclocross for the first time, if you go into that pit lane, you have to change bikes, don't you? And the riders here, pro level, so skilled, they don't, you don't really lose any time. No, no, the mechanics, everyone is so, so well trained as we see Vanderhaar just shooting up this hill. It's, uh, yeah, it's like you didn't even get off your bike. <laughs> you know, you just one, two step, boom, back on the bike. Uh, it's very, very efficient. As we see Don Soat and then Joris uh, Neumannhaus taking up second place and the uh, Powell Sazan riders are all in a line right behind him. It's almost hard to differentiate their kits. A lot of, a lot of red this year, which is, uh, <laughs> which is different. Other years we've had a lot of different colors up in the front, but this year a lot of orange and red. Yeah, a lot, it was blue for a lot of the time, wasn't it? Every kit was blue. Yeah. Marlock's bingo and all there. Yeah, it was a, it was an awful lot of blue arrival there. But uh, coming through, shoulders the bike, Dan Suter, Joris Neuvenhaus, quick feet from uh, the team Sunweb rider. And for Neuvenhaus as well, from in that World Tour Sunweb team, again, he'll be just, you know, thanking his lucky stars as well. The arrival on the road of Wout van Aert, Matthew van der Poel as well, to be able to, they will see because of, the, the, those riders to let Joris Neuvenhaus uh, stick with uh, with the Pro Cross program as well. I think that they've changed the perception for a lot of the uh, for a lot of uh, you know a lot of the teams now have said, hey, I think this is actually a good thing. Whereas before they were looking at it and saying like, well, it's too it's too too hard on your body, or there's not a you know there's no way that you could possibly do this. I think now, of course, though, all of these riders are exceptionally talented, so it's uh, so it makes it as you see how thick this mud is here, but um, but able to balance the demands of each. And it's you know it was the same for me when I was racing, Marty. It's like do I do 60 road races, 60 days of road racing a year? It's probably not great to do that much road racing. It's probably better to do maybe 25 to, to 35 races on the road, race days on the road, um, and then come into your cross season, do another 30 races. So you end your season around 60 race days. I don't. I think doing 100 race days or something like that is, uh, is a lot. It's, it's going to be too much, which is what we used to see back in the early 2000s. You see riders doing you know, closer to 100 days of racing on the road and combining those with cyclocross. And now, much more manageable. Uh, we have a lot more experience and a lot more people to uh, to take advice from and, and understand what the demands are of each, uh, each, each year and each season. Dan Suter leading out from his teammate, Ellie Isabit. Neuvenhaus trying to stay with him. Van der Haar. Then uh, you've got Quentin Hermans, Corny Van Kessel. There's Tone Arts just uh, right behind Laurent Swake here. But Pau Sals and Bingo, the two riders at the head of the race, just starting to uh, get a little bit of uh, distance, just a few meters over that uh, Team Sunweb rider, Joris Neuvenhaus. Then the Telenet Bauwas Lions riders. You've seen Sven Nace on the sidelines. Just be, uh, again, just getting that advice up to uh, the riders. If you're just joining us today, welcome aboard. This is the round one of the Telenet Super Prestige Series from uh, Gieten. Last year, it was Matthew van der Poel from Wout van Aert, Tone Arts, Lars van der Haar, Marcel Me uh, Meissen, Dan Suter, who's up here. He was sixth last year. David van der Poel was seventh. Kevin Powell's eighth. Joris Neuvenhaus was uh, ninth last year. And Gianni Vermeers was uh, tenth. The history of this race, Matthew van der Poel between 2016 and 2018, the winner Wout van Aert in 2015. Matthew van der Poel before that, Albert van Tornout, Nace Mjersen and Nace again over the last 10 years. Going through the line this time, it's Dan Suter and uh, Eli Isabit who uh, go through for uh, seven laps to go this time. So seven to go. So Suter and Isabit, it's just seven seconds back to Quentin Herman. So still a fairly uh, manageable gap, but they uh, don't want it to go out too much further. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see who takes up the work to bring that back. There's, uh, you know, obviously we have two of the same team riders coming back, but Hermans, you know, 
really riding strong this year. Yesterday, third place, having a great bit of form. He was riding well when he was here in the United States, again, for those early season races. He's trying to close this down, but two up front, and I only see one Telenet Balawaza rider riding on the front. Eric's not looking like he's on the day that he wants to have, and we see that, um, I mean, Corny Van Kessel maybe is in fifth or sixth spot there. So they're going to have to work together if they want to bring this back because you can guarantee that none of the riders from the Bingo team are going to have any interest in taking back Don Sote or Eli Easterbit. In this situation, though, it, it, when you see three riders from the teams with Joris Neuvenhaus in here as well, you know, as uh, Lars Bohm just uh, goes through the line this time in 15th place, is there that situation? It doesn't happen a lot when a rider will sacrifice themselves for their teammates because it, it's still very much an individual race, isn't it? It is an individual race, absolutely. I mean, I think, yeah, I think that these two could, uh, they have a similar interest, but the race definitely isn't over yet, Marty. As you can say, it's not out of sight, out of mind. I mean, Quentin is still driving it, and he's keeping the gap at very, at the very minimum at the same, if not taking a little bit back. So I think at these early, you know, this early part of the race, we're still about a third of the way in. Eli Easterby is showing again that he's got some great form. I think between these two, Don so is probably saying like, hey, I know that Eli's on good form. I'm going to try to stick his wheel and see what I can do and get away from here and get away from the group by sticking on Eli's lines and using him to maybe like motor pace him a little bit. But um, yeah, it, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a tough call. You know, when you're with a teammate, it's all about just being, being able to have a like-minded interest and not, um, and not mess up anyone else's race, you know? Yeah, so uh, just a few uh, questions as well over on the uh, forum from Scott uh, S. Scott uh, asking about uh, pinch flats um, in terms of uh, tyres. All pro riders all, all ride tubular tyres, generally the, the challenge tyres or the Griffos that are, uh, or the uh, challenge tyres or the uh, Dugas are the, uh, the two big uh, cross tyres that uh, most of the pros uh, like to ride. Again, it's pretty ominous at the moment again, Jeremy, in terms of Ellie Isabit at the front here, um, in terms of just starting to just pull out that little gap. He, he, we saw him over in the US, he does love the mud. Yeah, you know, being a lighter rider, a smaller rider, he's able to run a really low tire pressure. He's able to get a lot of traction um, and just do really well in these kind of low cadence situations. I was saying yesterday, you know, the strength and the big gear that he's able to push on the bike, I think is unique. And I think it is something that's, I would say, a trademark of his, at least for me, his ability to just push that big gear and still continue to be able to get back like up to speed, really snappy, maybe is something because of his age. You know, he's a younger rider, but, um, but it's definitely a combination that you don't see with a lot of riders. Usually you see higher cadence, really fast snappiness, but you don't see that ability to push that you know, 50 cadence as for a long time or to get up those big steep inclines like he's able to. Um, I just, I have a lot of memories of him racing those world championship races, pushing this massive gear and then being able to get really explosive directly after that effort. I think it's definitely, uh, genetically, I think he's got that, I think he's got that gift. So look at this uh, section here. Hermans is just trying to uh, find his way back as well. And uh, just again, our Spanish rider looks like he's uh, got a few issues there. Just uh, pulling into the side, just as he's about to be lapped. So lap four of 10 we are on here. A few of you just checking in over on Facebook. German Alonso Chacon just checking in from Colombia. Chris Bennett, top fan there. Thanks for saying hi. Uh, Mark Legg uh, just checking in, asking what happened to Gianni. Um, he was, uh, yes, uh, Gianni Vermeer, Great opening, great opening lap, but dropped back very, very quickly. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. It looked like he looked back uh, after the first time going up those stairs section. He looked back when they got to that flat top part, and I'm not sure if he was kind of saying like, hey guys, I need you to take over because uh, you know I've got a, a bent chain link or something. It looked like there might have been something there because he's he definitely, he. Uh, he had to drop the anchor a little bit. He had to go back, and um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see how he ends up finishing up. But definitely was unfortunate to see him uh, to see him not able to kind of hang on to that and, and capitalize from that good start that he had had early on.
Quinton Hermans gets on to Elias a bit here for telling it. Barwas Lions, good move by him to get in there. Ventura out, Arts and uh, Van Kessel, your next group through. You can see 39 seconds back to for you British fans to Tom Pidcock. Stan Godry having a good day as well, you would say, in 13th. Tonart, uh, t starts there at 119. David Van Der Poel at 120. Tom Mayusen is at 123. Camps at 124. Bacart is at 19th. Last Bohm now dropping back just a touch to 20th at the moment for Lars Bohm. A few of you checking in as well. So you're seeing Thomas Main has joined our coverage. Welcome, had a good race uh, yesterday. Kerry Lee Werner Jr. Uh, checking in as well. Thanks for uh, joining our coverage. And uh, Carlo uh, Gavanelli from uh, from Italy. Thanks for uh, all of you for getting on board as well as uh, Matthias Lindqvist over there in Sweden. If you've got questions uh, for Jeremy Powers, you can say hi and uh, give uh, Mavis just checking in. Give, uh, can we give Cameron, uh, Cameron Mason a little shout out? Yeah, Cameron's in there as well for Trinity Racing. Here we come round at the end of lap four here. So Quentin Hermans and Illy Isabit are your leaders. And you can see already here, Jeremy, that Van Torenout's taking the pressure off the front. This doesn't bode well. So Telenet Bauwas and Pau Sals and Bingo have both got a rider up the road. It's up to Joris Neuvenhaus here. Yeah, and Joris Neuvenhaus looking happy to just sit in this group and potentially grab third. I think this is that lull that I was talking about that Vanderhaar says just doesn't happen with the front riders anymore. The second group is saying, hey, we need to take a rest. We've been on the gas for 25 minutes. We need to take a little bit of a rest as we see Yanni Vermeer coming through in 11th place, recovering a bit from that early start, and then Pitcock just behind him. It's uh, it's great to see Quinton Hermans uh, throwing it at Ely Easterbeet today as we see, looks like Ely Easterbeet's bike here getting cleaned off off in the pits, going to need to turn that around. He went in for a bike exchange, but Quentin Hermans choosing not to, to take a little bit of extra rest, not having to get off the bike. Quentin Hermans moving over to the Wanty Gobert team, which is run by his old former manager, Hans Van Kasteren. He's going to be moving away from Sven Nice's team um, this, uh, this January when he lines up at Sven's race. He'll be in a new kit, Marty. Yeah, so it'd be, uh, it's going to be interesting for some teams. Lars Bohm as well, because his team is folding um, for next year as well. It's going to be, I haven't seen if he's managed to sign anything yet. But the, again, that could be why Lars has come back into, come back into cross. We saw him out there riding things like Dirty Kanza and that sort of thing. Maybe Lars is looking to forge a new career, could maybe ride cross in the winter, get out there, get back to his roots, ride gravel, gravel in the summer and, and do something different. Yeah, I mean, he's got a very decorated career, Lars Boom, uh, world champion, junior, uh, under 23, elite. I mean, he's got uh, in cyclocross, he's got the uh, he's got the background to be able to do what he likes. I think he can probably, to some extent, write his own ticket. Um, there will always be people having known him for a really long time. He's a he's a pretty cool dude. He's got a good head on his shoulders, and I have no no uh, no question that he'll have a a good end of his career with whatever he wants to do with it. And that chasing group, you can see it's former World Under-23 champion, former World Under-23 World Cup winner from Team Sunweb. He's got a whole clutch of uh, to the jerseys of the two leaders behind him. I'll just be hoping that that Team Sunweb man can drag them back up more towards the front. Quentin Hermans, though, is really pushing. Ellie Isabit here. Isabit on this sandy climb here, battling to stay back with uh, stay with Hermans as well. So these two just going toe-to-toe -to -toe here at the moment. Hermans is looking phenomenal at the front. Good question here, Jeremy, on uh, YouTube from Ivan Rodriguez. Gears. Just start asking, do riders use sprinter switches to change the gears on top of the bars if they're using the, the uh, your electric shifting? I do. I think that some of them do. Yeah, there is a there is the ability to kind of tuck them underneath um, and put them in different spots, potentially for like a sprint finish. Maybe they tuck them up under the uh, the drop part of the bar. Um, yeah, I can't say that they would probably have them on the tops. There wouldn't really be a place for them, you know, where you typically see them on a road bike, so that when you're climbing uh, on the tops, you can shift when you're up there. I don't think that the cyclocrossers generally need that. Maybe on their training bikes, that could be something that they would put there. But probably for a sprint finish, a couple of them would have those sprint uh, those sprint buttons down low. Dave, back to the to the front. Hermans and Isabit. So uh, we've seen uh, Isabit go solo in a lot of these races. Uh, Hermans 
recognise the danger of the Pal Sales and Bingo rider just going uh, up the road and uh, pulled him back. And now we have a very much a battle between these two riders. Their teammates, it looks like, are working in that group behind. Uh, lots of, you can see, very tough uh, conditions here in Heaton today in the Netherlands for uh, this race. Just uh, one of our Canyon DHB riders just uh, having a bit of a mechanical there. Couldn't quite make out if it was uh, Callum McLeod or Ryan Christensen um, from New Zealand. So uh, another nationality in there today in Ryan Christensen. Really, really great to be able to see uh, Quentin Hermans taking the lead of this race, really driving it and trying to put his mark on it. Last weekend, in a similar position with Lawrence Sweck, he was uh, he was off the front and Lawrence came past him with maybe a lap or just a lap and a half to go. Came past Quentin and when in the uh, in the finish uh, the finish interview, the interview had asked Quentin Hermans, "So what happened there at the end?" And he just simply said. Uh, Lawrence Sweet was stronger, like period, end of <laughs> sentence, and, and I think it took everybody a little bit by surprise because it's not often that, that the rider says that uh, just point blank, like, yep, just I didn't have it. <laughs> he was better. <laughs> That's a great shot here. Tone, uh, to, uh, you saw that chasing group. Tone arts as well because uh, for Tone, just wants to keep this, uh, keep this, this duo. Uh, within striking distance as well. Going through this, Suta Vermeersh, Pitcock still just outside of the top 10. He's in 12th. Then Muse and uh, T Sarts. Camp's going through there in 15. Did you see that ticker uh, going through here at half uh, distance uh, in uh, this one? Uh, just a question here as well, Robert Zemanek from the Czech Republic. Thanks for joining us. Uh, just asking about the little brake levers on the on the top of the bars. We don't see many pros. Uh, we don't see any pros really using the the, the kind of the bailout brake levers on the on the top of the bars. No, not anymore. With disc brakes, there's a you can use one finger braking now from right from the right from the uh, braking blades. It's not a uh, it's not necessary. Back in the day. With the cantilevers, you know, it used to be something nice to have on the tops. But uh, again, we're talking about that evolution of the sport, Marty. It's just not necessary. So, yeah, plenty of braking power coming from those discs, even if they're using the smaller ones, 140 rotors or 160. So much braking power. It's, it's almost too much. It's really changed the way that we race cyclocross, the ability to go down these descents, brake later, brake later using the tires in a different way. The cantilevers were a completely different feel. They were beautiful when I used them. I love cantilevers, <laughs> but I also have to say that I also love disc brakes. There, <laughs> it's uh, it's even a little safer. And I think the courses have been able to get a little bit more challenging with the uh, with the inclusion of disc brakes now. So tone arts going through five laps to go this time. Five to go. So 25 seconds is your gap. Then Van Kessel leads uh, Neuvenhaus and Van der Haar through next at 32. And then at 36, Swake, Adams, Van Torenhaus, Suta, then Vermeersch, the man that kicked everything off. So Suta there, Viet Vermeersch, just outside the top 10 there in 11th. Tom Pidcock was the next rider behind him. So these two leaders coming round. Easter Beat lines up for the bunny hops. Hermans uh, just goes to the side. There's Vermeersch. This groups, I think these two groups could come back together here. Yeah, it looks like Vanderhaar taking up, trying to uh, maybe set the tone. They've got, they're probably not quite as worried about Joris Neuvenhaus um, as Tunert has sort of set off on his own. Now these riders can sort of take it upon themselves to drill it and to get away as they don't have a ton of the uh, the Marlux riders with them. So they're going along just at a good clip, but not trying to necessarily bring the entire group back to Tunert. They want to make sure that they solidify that third spot on the podium somehow. So by putting a bunch of riders there on the front, taking back some time, it's good. But we got Ely Easterbeat off the front, along with Quinton Hermans. It was, uh, they've got, they've been having quite the duel here, back and forth, changing the lead up almost at least a couple times per lap. So showing respect, but taking down and ticking down these laps. We're gonna see some really exciting uh, last couple of laps in this race, Marty.
We are indeed. There's the long shot there. Tonart starting to put a little bit of time into this group behind. It means as well he's on his own. He's not bringing anyone up to those two leaders. Should he find his way up to the two at the front? Uh, uh, Dwight just asking, where is Tom Pidcock? You just saw him uh, on your screen there. Arnold Yo, just uh, give you a little shout out. Organizes cyclocross races in Singapore. Good on you. Um, so the Asia races. How can we gain more expansion to uh, the tremendous sport to be more popular? If you get, if you've got video of your races in Singapore, you can uh, send them over. We'll try and uh, feature them in the, the GCN Racing News Show as well. You can uh, send them over, and we can. Uh, and again, if you need advice, we're here to help you. So uh, send that in. Our leaders battle here. Eli Isabit just gets very tight to the uh, to the barrier there as well. Just uh, almost just wriggled his way around there. That's the thing as well. When you get to this point, Jeremy, when this course is really really cut up, you get into one of those sandy ruts, and it could just it could just put you anywhere. Yeah, he's getting, I can see right now that Ily Easterbeat is now pushing it. He's trying to get back on faster. He's absolutely trying to make a move right now to put Hermans under pressure. You can see in his body language and in the way that he's not breaking, he's going down these turns. He's opening up a small advantage to just check and see where is Quinton Hermans at? Is he going, do I need to start this process earlier of trying to get away? Or do I need to just try to do try to try to do something here just to check in just to see where it is Haramon's able to respond he's got maybe one or two bike lengths but that's nothing he can hear him behind him breathing heavily he can hear the claps in the mud with his feet he knows that Haramon's is responding to the attacks that he's putting down and as we see uh maybe it was getting a little too slow they could hear that Eric was in the background that he's coming back to them he doesn't want to be in a situation uh, Eli Isabit doesn't want to be in a situation where he has two riders from the same team, but he's continuing to push the pace, take some risks here. As you can see, he's got the bike on the limit, Marty. And again, that, that run-up just showed you as well. Uh, uh, Eli Isabit is a really, really phenomenal runner, isn't he? Just uh, getting a little replay in there, super hot through that section as well. Nicely done through there. Just showed how tight it was under there. Uh, again, it shows, Jeremy, this is where the run, for anyone that's watching Cross for the first time or new to the sport, it just shows how important the running part of your training ne needs to be on, on days like this. Yeah, it's just those quick transitions, right? It's on, off, on, off, and you have to be able to train like that. It's not just go out and do intervals at 500 watts or 200 watts or whatever you do. You have to have the ability to get on and off the bike. It's a bit of, it's it's a little bit of ballet out there with the bike. You have to be able to learn how to get off quickly and get back on quickly and get right back up to speed. So it's important to have a lot of different uh, technical uh, training as well for cyclocross. So this is really the moment, Marty, in the race for me where we're starting to see can Ely Easterbeat hold this pace and not have a and not have any errors he must feel comfortable on this part of the course as he starts to push the pace you can see there it is an error that's what I mean he's on the limit he's really pushing it Haramon staying much within himself and able to bring that gap right back down so we've got an awesome battle here for the fans to watch today Marty it is indeed you just saw Herman's just uh, sense that little mistake by Easterbeat enough to allow uh, Quentin Hermans to just come back to him for you uh, viewers as well. There's Ben Tullet there at 3.03 and 46. Uh, McLeod is still there. Callum McLeod at 30 is 33rd. Cameron Mason, 40th. Ryan Christensen, uh, 49th uh, through there. So a few riders being pulled now uh, going through that section. Let's have a little look here. So just again, just gets into that rut, loses it very slightly. That allowed Hermans. You just see Hermans just reacted instinctively to come back out of these turners look how explosive Eli Isabit is now uh, Jeremy is just pressing all the time just every time out of these little turns just a little burn just to see if he can break uh, Quentin Hermans he knows though he knows that he's got to start this process he sees that he's 40 minutes into the race they've got a few more laps to go here but he hasn't been able to break Hermans he's been trying now for five six minutes to put the pressure on, you can see that he's pushing the course to the absolute limit. When we saw him go just after the pits in that chicane turn, you can see they replayed us. He had a bit of an error there. Then he got into the sand, also clipped the pedal on that big, deep rut. He's just having a problem holding the speed. He's absolutely bending the tires and pushing the speed limits of this course right now to try to get away from Hermans. Hermans staying riding within himself, able to match the effort, but we will see what happens in these coming laps as he continues to apply pressure to Hermans. 
So Tonarts goes through there at 26 seconds. Van Kessel comes through the next group at 39. Neuvenhuis here as well, just uh, going through at 41. Van der Haar goes through at 42. Then Adams leads Laurent Swake and Michael Van Turen out next. A few of you as well, just in case there is uh, any confusion as well, you have Tonarts and T-Sarts, the brothers in this race. So uh, if you see T-Arts along the bottom, just in case it's confusing. So you've got both Tonarts, who is uh, sitting in third at the moment, and then T-Sarts is a little bit uh, further down in this one. For Tonarts here as well, the Belgian champion, we're used to that late fire from Tonarts as well. What he's going to be hoping is he went through that time at 26 seconds. We've seen Tonarts pull gaps back four laps ago, potentially. He'll just be hoping that perhaps in the final here that Isabi and Hermann start looking around at each other just a touch and it might just allow him to maybe close the gap slightly more. Yeah, I mean, I think that Easterbit has uh, slowed the pace slightly. You can see that he's not pushing it through this section. He's just taking a bit of a breather. As we see Ertz coming into the picture now, Hermans is not going to try to push the pace. In a perfect world, um, uh, Tune Ertz is able to come back to this group, and they're able to use their power as a one-two punch against Easterbeat. Easterbeat being so strong throughout the season, taking so many victories already, both World Cups in the States, yesterday's race, the weekend before taking both days. I mean, he is the person that everyone tries to beat. He's got the, he's in the crosshairs, so to speak. A shout out to my buddy Bill Shake in there. He's in the crosshairs. He's definitely, people want to take him out. They were trying to take him down. He's not, uh, he's not a bad guy. He's just the guy to beat. <laughs> So a few of you asking as well, Tom Pidgott sitting in 12th at the moment. There's Ben Turner at 17. So uh, Ben Turner there as well. Just Des White asking a little question over on YouTube. It's one that comes up quite a lot on our, uh, in our questions. Uh, are any pros using one buys or is everyone still on, on a two buy? As Ellie Isabet here again just tries to crack Quentin Hermans. We, we saw some one buys last year, but it seemed a lot of the pros, you know, still favor the two buy. Yeah, it doesn't matter. As we see, Hermans having a small error there, just missing that rut a little bit, but able to kind of bring it back. You can see they're both on the rivets still in this more technical side of the course. I would have to say that uh, it's really personal preference, right? Two by, one by, not necessarily um, a big difference between the two systems, especially on the track. Like you don't see the riders typically shift if they have a if they have a two by setup. A lot of the riders run a size 46 chainring and cycle cross at the pro level, so they're almost always in the 46. I can only think. Of of a handful of courses where they may come out of a 46, something like a, the Namur World Cup would be one of them that I think maybe they would. But honestly, a lot of these riders, as you can see, they have that big leg strength. It's a uh, almost a prerequisite in cyclocross to be able to use the, the, the push that big gear. And so these riders, a 46, 32 or something like that, that's that's no problem at all. They're easily able to push that and get up a majority of the climbs that they see. As we see two Ertz coming into himself here, really being able to come back and bring this gap. As we said, Tone Arts, that little burn that he makes, that uh, explosive effort that he got, and he has chopped a big chunk out of this gap. He has those two leaders in his sight, shouldering the bike on this long run now. The long legs here of Tone Arts. Can he run his way back onto Quentin Hermans and Eli, uh, Eli Isabit and make it a three horse race at the front? Isabit, though, will recognize the danger, as Jeremy said moments ago. He won't want two riders from the same team, and you can see there, Jeremy Isabit just glanced across to his right, saw that Tone Arts was starting to close the gap back down, and what you can't do at the front of any cross race is start to get comfortable. No, Isabit still trying to keep the tempo high. He can look back here on this 180 section and see that Ertz is coming, knows that he's trying, but there's definitely, Isabit's probably right now trying to think, okay, I've got another 20 or so minutes left of this race, 18 minutes. There's only so much time that I have. Where am I going to pick? Where can I put uh, pressure on and, uh, and potentially make a mistake and then capitalize from that? He doesn't want Ertz to come back, but we've got a race on our hands, Marty. This, These three coming together would be an absolute perfect day to start the Super Prestige off. 
Again, Tonarts has looked over the last couple of races to me again, where he's just lacking just a tiny little bit at the top end, but it just seems again today, we've seen it with rider after rider today, that it's just sort of clicking into place. Just a, a few races in, and they're just starting to find their way. And the gap you can see here, 12 seconds. And again, it's all about now nailing this course, every section, no errors, none of those minute little mistakes if you can help it. He's a bit though, pressing on again, just probing little testing attacks just to see if he can crack um, Hellmanns, but also try and prevent Tonarts from getting back on. Jeremy, we see it from Tonarts when he try, when he does this, he has to try and get on as quickly as possible, doesn't he? Yeah, he does, and I think that uh, right now Easterbeet's trying. He's trying his best. He's taking a bike exchange here, as is Hermans. That's going to give Ertz another advantage if he decides to not to. But the mental blow that is going to happen when Ertz catches these guys or gets closer is going to really weigh heavy on Eli Easterbeet. That that just that that when someone's coming back and bringing time back on you, that means that you're not going the fastest. Yes, you may have gotten time ahead, but if here if they sit up as Easterbeet looks to be doing, he's not continuing to drive or sprint. Or bring it way back up to speed he's just slowly coming back on he knows he has a bit of a gap but he's not trying to extend right now but when he was trying to extend he wasn't having success and so that's going to weigh on them heavily as they continue to go through these laps and tick them down towards the finish three to go tone arts is back to 10 seconds now arts is at 10 so now closing that gap. That is a closable gap now as Isabit makes another move. Hermans is just sticking with him now. He's letting Eli Isabit dictate the pace here. He jumps all the time. 10 seconds, so that gap from Tonart, it's come back down. He was at 25, 26 seconds. Now just chopping that gap out, but uh, does he now have the endurance and the power to get back on here? He's a bit the man of the moment, leading out here. Tone Art, he got, uh, we've got uh, three laps to go. You can see just underneath there, he's a bit on these sections, which just able to glance across and see where Tone Art is. He shouldn't be far away. Here's Courtney Van Kessel, Lars van der Haar, and Joris Neuvenhaus. You can see with the skin suit unzipped all the way as uh, we go through these sections just keep the clock on uh, tone arts here can he close this one back down easter beat finding himself in a position where he knows he needs to start to go hard to be able to keep two off the back he's seeing again can i crack quinton hermans can hermans match this pace can he match my technical skills at this speed he's continuing to push it i think that again in this position easter beat is the person that they have to beat right he's been riding strong hermans matching him though but you can see now the cadence and the determination on easter beats face is that and excuse me on his face is that he really wants to win this race today and he's going to do everything that he can to keep two nerds off the back and continue to put uh, quentin harriman's under pressure oh that trade we just a little shake of the head there from uh, elise a bit so we'll see if we get a replay of that one we went back there quite quickly to, uh, oh, Elisabeth. this is important, just, Marty. This is yeah. the moment when uh, when Quentin Hermans comes underneath him. Oof, and it's just enough. Air oh, here we go. Let's check this out. Oh, there yeah. we go. Going in hot. And uh, Hermans as well slides out, catches the back wheel. That might just hand sort of four, maybe four seconds potentially to Tone Arts, um, a mistake Again. like that. Again, this is the this is how it's going to happen. Eric is going to know. He's going to have heard from the announcers. He's going to be able to hear that the same way that Eli Eusebiet heard that that Toon Eretz was at 10 seconds when he came through the finish line and started to lay down that attack. Ertz is going to hear from the crowd. He's going to hear from his manager that they've had a problem. Look how close he is now. He's coming back, and we're going to have a three-person battle at the front of this race, Marty. Oh, this is looking good now. Again, it's those little errors that can creep into your riding when you know you're being pushed by someone like Tone Arts behind. And he's a bit, just saw he went in super hot into that turn, slid out on the bridge, that change in surface as well. Getting into some of these sections here. Arts is almost with them now. We're onto the steps. Arts rides as long as he can. Those long legs now of Tone Arts on the run up here. We're on lap eight of 10. Tone Arts is about to make contact with 
at the head of the race, and he oh. does. We now have a three rider battle. The podium here will come from this one. It's two riders from Telenet Balwaz Lines, Quentin Hermans, Anton Arts, Ellie Isabit. Jeremy, what does Isabit do now? Does he now have to try and put in a big move to just as Tone Arts gets on, who will have made that effort to close the gap and try and distance him? Like I said, the mental blow now to Easterbeat is big. And now Hermans is going to slow the pace down through this technical section and make a big effort to allow Tunerts to get a little bit of energy back. He's made a big effort to get up to them. So Hermans now is going to try to slow things down in this technical section. And he's doing a really good job to be able to allow Ertz to take a little bit of a breather. And I'm not talking about much, but I'm talking about <laughs> a little bit of a breather. But the, uh, the team boss, Sven Nies, has got to be licking his chops about this situation that they've got themselves into right now with Pelly at Balawaza. This is great. great. This course, this race always gives us a phenomenal battle in this one. We've seen so many over the years. The last few years with Juan Van Aert and Mathieu van der Poel. But Tonarts, his teammate, is on the front here. Tonarts, as you can see, he's breathing through his ears after that effort that he's made to get up to these two riders. But uh, he now has to try and recover from that effort, the Belgian national champion right on the back of this group. So there's your uh, next place to riders just dropping down there. But Hermans comes through towards the front. Now Telenet Balwaz Lions have got the uh, east of it sandwiched in between these two riders. Jeremy, what's going through the head now of east of it? Yeah, I think he's thinking that this race is run from the front. You know, he needs to bide his time and he needs to lay a very, like, a potent blow. You know, he's got to, like, attack kind of like a cobra, just really hit these guys hard once and for all and try to make it stick and push the boundaries of this course's limits and just, like, try to force something. Because, like I said, this race, as far as I can tell, is one from the front, right? These sections being on the front and not having an error and being able to just get one or two bike lengths is how you win this one. It's not a race that's got a lot of wide open sections it's more there's one or two lines but once you're into these parts this last half of the course it really looks to be a race that's going to be won from the front and it's going to allow the rider to potentially push the riders to make a mistake as you see easter beat having a problem there losing one or two bike lengths to quentin Herman who's pushing the pace now on him it is. So now the Telenet Bauer's lines face off against Ellie a bit of Pal Sals and Bingo. You saw Lars van der Haar just riding through the uh, the water on the side of the lake. But uh, now the uh, the two Telenet Bauer's lines riders can go play the one-two off against uh, Eli Isabit. Isabit will just, again, just be going through the tactics book in his head. Tonarts gives himself a hand sling around that one, but it looks like his teammate is starting to put Tonarts in just to a little bit of difficulty after that effort that Tonarts made to cr cross that gap. Hermans now looks back over his shoulder and he's pressing on here. Tonarts is in a world of pain. Yeah, he, maybe Hermans doesn't know what he's doing, but he is absolutely trying to make sure that he keeps the pace really, really high. Ertz not going to let this one go. I can tell you that he's going to turn himself inside out to stick on those wheels. And uh, like I said, there's a lot of yo-yoing that's going to happen in this first half of the course. It's much, much faster, not as technical. So his ability to take a little bit of a breather and sit in the slipstream of these other riders is a lot higher on this first half of the course, Marty. So going through here, so Hermans, Isabit, Arts, uh, Van Kessel, Van der Haar are your next two riders to go through the line this time with two laps to go. Tone Arts still not quite on here at this point. It would almost be worth uh, the Telenet Balwaz lines just riders just trying to push Ellie Isabit back through towards the front. Or again, Jeremy, is this just showing up the team situation in cyclocross? Well, I think it's just, uh, I think Ertz is just having a moment after that big effort to get back on. But like I said, he's got the bit in his teeth. He's not going to let these guys go. He's going to continue to turn himself inside out. This isn't a sizable gap. Eli Easterby can still hear Toon Ertz back there. He hears him breathing. He knows that he's under a little bit of pressure, but everybody is right now. This is the last, there's only about 10, 12 minutes left in this race, so they know that there's going to be some chinks in the armor of everyone. Easter beat to me personally, doesn't look like he's on his best day. He's had a lot of errors. We've seen him race previously, almost zero mistakes. Today, probably five, six, seven mistakes happening out there. It's obviously a really technical track, but Hermans has been able to match him. As we see, Ertz having to dig now to get back up to speed to be able to match Hermans, his teammate, who's turning the screws right now on Easter bit. 
So there you have it, he's getting back in there. You just saw again the tactics behind Lars van der Haar running the planks today, not bunny hopping, and we saw him uh, take a bit of a tumble last week. He's decided that uh, the fractions of time that he uh, might lose by running them is worth the sacrifice. He's staying with uh, Corny van Kessel, just finding his way back onto his teammate over that bridge for our three leaders where we saw uh, Eli Isabits uh, slide out uh, the lap before. Arts has found his way back in here. But these three riders lap nine of ten if you're just finding our broadcast for the first time here on GCN Racing welcome aboard we are in Heaton first of round of eight here in the Telenet Super Prestige uh, series and it's Quentin Hermans, Eli Isabi and Tone Arts are your three leaders what can the man in the red do to prevent Telenet Balwas Lions from taking the victory for Mirsch and Suter you can see there just outside that uh, around inside that top 10 Michael Van Toren out Tom Pidcock still riding in 12th place T-Sarts is in 13th Tom Mayusen is 14th at 2 minutes and 12 but it's all about the battle for the victory and the podium places Kenton Hermans again through this section that uh, seems to suit him onto the steps Tone Arts this is where he got on the lap before it's taking him a while to recover here Jeremy this is an important section, Marty. If Hermans is able to keep Ily Easterbit at bay, that means they're going to go down to the last lap. This is one of the first times that I remember seeing Quinton Hermans take the lead on this technical part of the track. This is where uh, Ily Easterbit had been trying to push the push the tempo to force a mistake, and Hermans was able to match him. So if Quinton Hermans is able to keep the running pace high and is able to keep Ily Easterbit in that second position behind him through this technical section coming up, then the last opportunity for a big for a, uh, for a big switch as we see Isabit maybe trying to get to the front here is uh, is going to be in this last lap. So the last lap of this race, Marty, going to be a real nail biter. I was going to say, looking at the races so far, looking at this race where it's panned out over the last nearly the an hour, for Eli, for Eli Isabit, where would he, where has he got to go? Where, where would you say are the most uh, sort of beneficial sections where he could actually try and make that move? It's going to be through this section, this last one that we've just seen coming into that first downhill, twisty, sandy section. After the start finish, they're going to come into this. You can go through that top road section. Then they're going to come into this technical section here. This is where the race is going to go down all through here, Marty. This would be the last opportunity here on this sand section to potentially jump in front before they get into that single tracky stuff with all these tight ruts. But like I said, now look at what's happening. Air slides himself in to create a gap just like that. And now he's to be four or five bike lengths off and he's got a chance drop so now Eric's taking himself out of the race putting his chain back on not intentional but put himself in there and drops his chain oh what a heartbreaker for Eric today oh look at that tone arts game over for the Belgian champion can't get the chain out of there what a shame for uh, tone arts it looked like that was about where he was about to make his move got up onto the wheel of his teammate had recovered enough but now that hands it back to quentin hermans as he gets passed by corny van kessel and lars van der Hart, taking him ages to get his chain back on so after all that effort heartbreak for tone arts he got himself up to the leaders and now this is this is this is what happens though, Jeremy, isn't it? This is cyclocross. This is what makes this sport so exciting. After all of that, you've now got to run to the pits to get a bike change. Oh man, heartbreak for sure. Looks like he maybe just slammed it in there, came a little close and then hit it maybe on one of those legs on the uh, metal barricade. I haven't seen a replay of it yet, so I don't know, but it created an attack by not doing anything. It essentially created an attack by putting uh, by putting Ely Easterbeat four or five bike lengths off at a really hard time in the course where he's now had to had to uh, close that gap back to Harrimans. So now Harrimans knows my teammate's not with me anymore. It's a two-up battle, and now I've got to take the bull by the horns and try to finish this race off. They have a crushing uh, blow for Tone Arts, the Telenet Balwas Lions riders as well. You just saw the way Corny Van Kessel and Lars van der Haar glanced at the man here, and you can see just being passed by Swake and Vermeersch behind him. And uh, this is what happens. You've got to find your way back round to the pits. We're going to go through. It's going to be the bell lap for Quentin Hermans and uh, Eli Easterbit. Bell lap. And uh, for Easterbit, with Tone Arts getting on here, Isabit just had that, he did the right thing, he just sat there, he just defended, he just took the attacks 
from the uh, from Quentin Hermans, and it's almost given himself a chance to recover. But this is absolutely heartbreaking, this, isn't it? Yeah, after such a good race, I mean, I think we could have potentially seen Ertz take the win today. He was on a good bit of form there at the end. He looked really, really strong. So he's got a long run in front of him, unfortunately, Marty. But yeah, as we see here, Eli Isovic going to be looking for that moment to pounce. If he's going to take Quentin Hermans over, it looks like they're both just sitting right now. But man, the tension is high as we come into these last technical sections. Is is Easterbeet going to let Hermans come through? I would have to say that Easterbeet is probably thinking that I, I have a good shot in the sprint he's a very good sprinter but Hermans is thinking I'm very good technically today and I've really seen all of the chinks in Eli Isterbitt's armor and I'm gonna be able to I'm gonna try to push it on the sections that I've marked in my head as him having a hard time with so it'll be, it's gonna be great to watch this last lap these run-ups as well he's got very very fast feet has uh, Eli Isterbitt there you can see Sway, Vermeer, Suter, Neuvenhaus goes through so eight for Suter at the moment. Neuvenhaus is sitting there in ninth. Tonarts now is down to tenth. Tonarts, the uh, he will be he will be uh, screaming internally from that one. He'll now try and get his way back up towards the front. Lars van der Haar just being distanced, uh, just a touch by his teammates. So your order. You've got Hermans, East a bit, then uh, Van Kessel, Van der Haar, Adam Swaik, Vermeer, Suter, Neuvenhaus, and Tonart here. The Belgian champion will be brought on. And there you have it. And there again, we were chat, chat, chatting a little bit about uh, equipment choice. Was that the right choice today? East a bit goes right down off of that bridge, comes through towards the front. Tom Pidcock still sitting there in 12th. Tsarts in 13th with Mayus and Turner now up to 15th for British fans at 307, just ahead of teammate Timo Kielik. Sieben Wouters there going in, just dropping that left foot out. East a bit trying to make his move this is it. through there. This is it, Marty. This is exactly where I was saying now. Uh, East of it on the front, trying to bend the tape again and really put Hermans under pressure, not wanting to take it down to a sprint finish, although I'm sure he's willing to. But you can see here he's got two bike lengths on this very fast part of the course, really exploding up this little punchy section, trying to dig in and put pressure on Hermans. Is this the race winning move now for Ellie Isabit? That climb, Isabit was on fire in Kroibika yesterday on the climbs. Hermans trying to battle back. Can he find his way back up to Ellie Isabit? This is Isabit's uh, race winning move here onto the steps, onto the runs. Fast feet for the Pau Sows and Bingo rider. Isabit takes a little glance back over the shoulder. He'll see that he's got some meters advantage over Quentin Hermans onto the top. The remount here for Ellie Isabit looking good. The camera just goes back here to Lars van der Haar. Yes, as we see, Isabit just coming a little bit sideways, not enjoying this pace. He's going so fast. He just has shown that he doesn't like going at the speed on this course. He's defying the speed limits that have been placed by Mother Nature on this course. And he's going so fast to try to break Quentin Hermans, but Hermans is matching him just pedal stroke for pedal stroke. And as they go through this nasty section with the run, Hermans is right there. He can hear him. He knows it's not in the bag, but he's desperately trying to get away from Hermans as he continues to just boom, 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 legs, bike down, looking back, can't take any advantage right now from Hermans. Hermans is fighting tooth and nail to stick Eli Iserbit's attack. And again, remounts on the downhill part of that one, making sure that he's got full forward momentum on that. Ellie Easterbit, what a season that Easterbit is having here. And onto the sand, this is the uh, the section here. Where Jeremy said this race could be won or lost, but again, just stretching that advantage. And it's growing now over uh, Quentin Hermans. Easterbit really is the man of the season so far, isn't he, Jeremy? He is, and this is going to be important now that he's got a bit of a gap. He's got a little bit to play with. He can just take a little easier in these turns. He's been trying to force the pace through this section in the last couple laps, and he's been unable to ride it at the speed that he's been trying to. So the course has really limited his ability to put down that power. He has the snap. He has the power, but the course hasn't been allowing him to be able to throw it down. This time, he's finally stuck it. He's taken some risks, and he's got probably a 10 bike length advantage over Quentin Harrimont, and he's going for it, Marty. 21 years old, Ellie East a bit. The, uh, the Pau Sals and Bingo rider, this team, the team so long of the likes of Kevin Powell's. But, uh, what a season that he is having. And the, uh, the Jingle Cross 
the uh, the Trek uh, World Cup in Waterloo as well. Second at the Mer Baron Cross in Merlebeek and first in the polder cross in Croybeeker yesterday. Great start to the season Easterbit is having. And uh, again, this is a big one for Pal Sals and Bingo. Tone Arts, what a day for him. He's uh, starting to grow, just claw back some of the gap. There's Laurent Swake uh, just ahead of him. And uh, Gianni Vermeersch just comes through towards the front of that group. What a shame. What might have been for that man there in the Belgian champions jersey. He'll take like a lot of uh, he'll take a lot of positivity away from this race, Marty, with the with the way that he was able to come back and the ability to take those times down. So as we see Easterby coming out of the turn, bringing the pace up, we see someone just casually walking across the course. So we know that there is some daylight between him and Hermans now. Easterby able to finally put together this last lap as he comes in for the finish line. He'll be really proud to take this one today, Marty. He hasn't finished lower than second so far this season. Ellie Isabit takes yet another victory here for Powell Sows and Bingo. What a phenomenal start to this season for this man, just 21 years old. Quentin Hermans, it's second place for him today. And there's 17 seconds. Look at that. What a gap to open on that final lap. 17 seconds. Yeah, I think at some point, once the race was over, the race was over, you know? it's uh, <laughs> There's not much to see there. As we see this good, this battle between the Telenet Balawaza crew, Corne Van Kessel looks like Vanderhaar going to take him to the line with the sprint. <laughs> little smile there from Lars Vanderhaar. A little sprint with Corne Van Kessel. So they uh, come across the line. So it's Hermans Van Kessel. Van der Haar, Van Kessel makes the podium. Jens Adams is your next rider here from Pal Sals and Bingo. So good day as well, you would say, for Jens Adams into the finishing uh, straight now. He is going to take fifth on the day, just over the minute down on uh, Eli Isabit. So good day for them. They get the top spot on the podium. Then the uh, the uh, riders come in behind. Is that Swake and Vermeersch? Just getting themselves cleaned up, ready for, for the podium. And here is Tone Art. So Dan Suter was the rider uh, just in our picture with Diani Vermeersch. There's Laurent Swake. He comes in in eighth. And uh, Tonart has got to be happy with this one. Yeah, Tonart has got to be happy with this one, Marty. I mean, after such a good race and then such a hard day, he's going to put his hand out. You know, what the heck? It was a heck of an effort. He'll be happy to salvage his super prestige because this, again, not, you know, getting ninth is more points than getting 19th or, or not finishing at all. So a good effort for him to finish up as we, uh, as we see Neuvenhaus finishing up here in 10th spot after showing himself very strongly in the first half of this race. Yeah, good day for him today. Getting back into uh, his cross season. So he is our 10th uh, placed rider in Joris Neuvenhaus. There's Michael Van Turenhout coming in uh, next. He's the next rider to uh, come home here. So Laurent's uh, Sweek takes eighth. So it's uh, Isabit from Hermans, Van Kessel, Van der Haar, Adam Suter, Vermeer, Sweek, Arts, and uh, Neuvenhaus. 11th place here. For Michael Van Toren out is that uh, we had uh, Tom Pidcock not far away. So Van Toren out is the next rider. T Sarts is going to come in here in the 12th place for Telenet Balois. So that's T Sarts. That's the other T Arts you can see there. 242. Here's Tom Pidcock from uh, Trinity Racing. So uh, second cross race of the season for Tom Pidcock, the British champion. And again, it's uh, again, Jeremy, it just takes a few races just to find your rhythm, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, you got to look at the races as training, too. You know, these uh, yesterday was a really hard training session for Pitcock. Today is a really hard training session for Pitcock. These are his first races. I guarantee you, no matter how much massage or sleep he was able to get yesterday, along with that four-hour drive, um, he's still going to be sore. As we see Tom Mayusen coming in and a sprint among teammates here from the uh, Crayfin team to finish off and round out that top 15. Keelick and Turner, the uh, two riders of Ben Turner coming in there in 16th uh, place for him. Sieben Wouters is going to be the next rider to come home. So Sieben Wouters just ahead of Marcel Meissen. So Meissen, the uh, German champion, is uh, going to come in uh, next. So Meissen just uh, in 18th place here. 
coming through. So 351 separating them. So Marcel Meissen, the uh, Coronet Circus rider, and then the, uh, the other riders getting into the cleaning station. Getting themselves set up for the next day. But Jeremy, what can we say about that? We had a little bit of everything there, didn't we? It was just uh, drama all the way. I mean, to, you've got to feel for Tone Arts, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. That is a heartbreaker for sure. Like I said, I think that there was a chance for the win today from Ertz. The way he nailed the course in in the last half and was able to really make it happen. So let's take a look at what happened here. We can see the focus on Lars van der Haar's face at the start. Boom, in the pedals. But it was Yanni Vermeersch, Marty, that took the start by uh, right, right from the get-go. It was Laurent Swake. You can see there van der Haar got a good start. So did Quentin. Hermans, there's Meissen, there's just a few riders of that rider going down right at the start, just uh, delayed our Canyon DHB rider just on the inside. But yeah, Yanni Vermeersch led out here for Kref and he got the absolutely nailed this climb the first time. And then uh, they disappeared through there. And when they came out, he was sitting in third. So we, didn't, we never quite yeah. saw what happened there. Yeah, we didn't see what happened, but uh, but you know, as it is with bike racing, things happen. The riders were uh, were super challenged, as we saw Pidcock. He had this little bit of a slip right here on the stairs, and um, that took a little bit of wind out of his sails. But again, just getting back on the cross bike, we see Ertz is there in the top ten. But we saw straight away it was uh, it was Don Sote and Eli Easterbeet at the front of affairs with Quinton Hermans closing that gap down, and then we saw uh, Eli Easterbeet and Hermans were the two that came to the front and had a heck of a battle throughout the middle part of this race. It wasn't until later that uh, Quentin Hermans was trying his best to turn the screws on Eli Easterby. They both went blow for blow, each of them trying to push the pace. But Ertz came back in dramatic fashion to be able to pull these guys back and come closer and closer and whittle down from 10 seconds, 15, 10 seconds, 5 seconds, and then a small error on the uh, on that uh, on that over um, Sorry, on the flyover, allowed Ertz to get back on, which was the, probably the most dramatic part of today's race, Marty. It was indeed. There was the bike changes. Issa bit was all the time pushing, testing Quentin Hermans to not let Tone Arts get back. This is this trademark acceleration. That was the mistake there. Uh, Quentin Hermans came in as well. He slid off. That's really where it uh, handed the advantage back to Tone Arts behind. You saw how much it slowed those two onto the steps, the, uh, the big legs of uh, Tone Arts. This section, he ran back on to the two leaders this was uh, setting us up beautifully for the finish and he sat back he tried to recover quentin hermans came through towards the front he just started to uh, put his teammate again into a little bit of difficulty east of it was starting to work out how am i going to try and take this one from these two uh, riders it was uh, this was the point coming into this corner just uh, drops the chain and that was it. It was game over for Tone Arts at this point. Yeah, it's hard to know exactly what happened there. It looked like he just he tried to sneak himself in and then somehow got the chain all uh, bobbled up there and then just ended up breaking it at the end. I'm not sure if he broke it or if it broke, but definitely a problem with the chain for him there after he hit something or had a problem. But then it was back to a two-person battle. Easterby got his leg out here on this section as he started to bend the course tape or the bars as we see here, really <laughs> punching it over this climb. And this was the moment where he was really trying to put some daylight between him, looking back constantly to see, am I doing any damage to Quentin Hermans? As he comes into this last section, he can look back on this 180 and know that he's got about five six seconds the race to the uh to the finish line had just ended and here he is really happy to take this hard fought victory here in Houston in the netherlands for the first round of the super prestige what a powerhouse he is a monster so far this season i know a lot of you cyclocross fans are looking forward to seeing how this man will fare, uh, fare against Matthew van der Poel when Matthew van der Poel comes back into racing. It's difficult to tell, Jeremy, sometimes, isn't it? You're looking at this one. We always have this kind of this, this omnipresence of Matthew van der Poel kind of over the top of everything. At the moment, Ellie is a bit, just looks like, you know, he's he really has to step. What a record. He, you know, he hasn't been off the podium yet. 
Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's gonna be, uh, I think it's gonna be hard for him when uh, Vanderpool comes back because he's gonna have a player in the game immediately. Almost every interview that I've heard with Ely Easterbeat since he's been being so dominant this year has asked him about Matthew Vanderpool. I don't know exactly what he's thinking, but uh, I've been catching up with Erwin Vervecken each week for a, a new feature that's coming out that everyone should be getting pretty excited about, and Erwin's been saying that a lot. So I'll be sure to ask him about his opinion of what he thinks about Eli Easterbeat at the moment. In terms of, again, for, for Tone Arts there, you know, it, for Telenet Balwas Lions, they did absolutely everything right there. And, and that's, that is cyclocross, isn't it? A mechanical, having to, having to run to the pits. He's not the first rider that's been in that position and he certainly won't be, won't be the last. No, he won't be. And the thing is, is that this happens to everyone. You know, you never get out of a season without having at least one mechanical or one bad thing happen. So he was really probably happy to be able to, uh, as we see again here, oof, just having a problem. And you can hear him almost yelling, like, what the heck? And you see Easterbeat having to close that gap down. But the truth is, is that he salvaged his day. That's a very professional thing to do. Keep on trooping. He realizes there's no chance. You know, he can't fix the bike now. He's got to just run with it. He's got to just take, take the time to get to the pits get a new fresh bike and continue to move forward because like i said before ninth is better than 19th and it's a lot better than not finishing at all not finishing the first opening round of the super prestige would have been terrible for his overall classification and run at that title yeah i mean for the 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 we the, the some of the, among us you know we would have thrown our toys and everything else out the pram at that point it does <laughs> it does it's a great demonstration of this at this level you just keep riding, you know, the race Absolutely. isn't over until it's over. And, and that's a, that's a great lesson in, in this. Is it when you've raced, you've raced all of these series in Belgium and, and we've kind of, we've had the Ethias cross. We've, we've, uh, you know, we've had different rounds. We've had the Rectivit series as well, but this super prestige series, is there just a shift in everything when you come into here's atmosphere pressure that goes along with these super prestige races? I mean, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, one of, there's a lot of, uh, well, prestige to be able to win this title, um, to be able to take this. One of the uh, highlights of Sven Nice's career when I was able to talk to him uh, at his uh, at his HQ in, um, in Ball, Belgium, for a feature that we did together, he was actually most proud of his 13 overall super prestige titles. So as, uh, as you would say, like amongst, amongst the European riders, these events are just, these these are the crown. Like these are the biggest events that you can um, that you can aspire to do well in in European cyclocross. And in terms of looking at uh, the other riders, that you know, Gianni Vermeer as well. You know, great great start um, for him. And other riders again, when you when you come into these races, when you get that that good start, it you know sometimes you can almost gas yourself as well. We didn't see what kind of happened to Yanni Vermeer there, but you can kind of get a little bit too excited when you find yourself at the at the front of the race as well because they're long. That was a tough tough day out there. I was, yeah. And again, racing yesterday, four-hour drive, probably not a great night of sleep. Just all those things kind of combined, really going to make it for a tough day out there. Um, yeah, who knows what happened with Vermeer. It's fine to have a bad day on the bike. There's so many more races to go, Marty. And in terms of though, you know, the, where we go from here next week, we go into uh, another round of uh, the Supresti series. We go to Bone. We started going back into those, those first uh, European World Cups as well. Uh, next weekend so it, it's it's a big weekend again and there's that trade-off as well do we how much do i want to concentrate on the super prestige series and that world cup as well because there's a we do see riders do it go from super prestige and then go down to to burn in in switzerland for for that one that's a again that's a lot of traveling i mean i think that all of them you know all these riders are just trying to pick a point and say, I want to be good here. And then they're able to see how they do. And then if they're going well in one, well, then they maybe focus on that one more. The DVV trophy doesn't kick off until the Koppenberg uh, on November 1st, I believe. And so that is going to be, uh, that's going to be another opportunity to sort of start off on the right foot at another one of the, the most prestigious um, like European cyclocross series that are in existence at the moment. So yeah, exciting times to come. Lots of great racing. And in terms of that, the the course that we had here today in Heaton, the the sand, the sand dunes, and we get them, you know, this race, the 
the Coxider World Cup as well. I mean, as a, for for all our viewers that are coming in, you know, we see it on the comments. Lots of viewers are are watching this before they go off and and race themselves. It, it's how how can you improve that that sand riding? It does does it does the sand vary as well that you go that you've raced all over the world? Does it vary from country to country? Yeah, I think it does. I mean, I think that uh, the European sand seems to be pretty similar from what I've raced it, but sometimes you get that very fine sand. Sometimes you get that more thick sand. The thing that I can say that really does change is that if it has precipitation, if the if the sand has moisture in it, then it really does form some really beautiful ruts, which make for a nice cyclocross like course. They they get chopped in, and then the ability to just rail them and just come through and use your body weight and your momentum to carry you through one section to the next. Um, sand is, in my opinion opinion in cyclocross is like that is the ultimate to be able to ride sand gracefully it's so challenging but at the professional level it is uh, it is some one of those techniques that you really have to train at you have to have success with and um, that's what makes a complete cyclocross rider so lots of sand also to come this year and is it high revs as well get the get the gear high um, and gear selection through the sand it's uh you know it's more of a weight back push the bike out in front of you and um, a little bit bigger gear in fact you don't want to be super high on the gears as we see these guys kind of coming through we see pitcock there slapping hands with everybody just saying hello probably nice to catch up he probably hasn't been able to see everyone but you see um Eli easterbit there just downing a protein shake to make sure that he's doing the maximum amount of recovery that he can they're all uh, kind of hanging talking about a good day's battle behind before they get out there to get that podium going there you have Tom Pidcock there, Trinity Racing. The uh, riders just kind of uh, having a chat with each other, kind of that debrief afterwards as well in terms of uh, what went on out there on the uh, the racetrack. There's uh, Ellie Isabit and uh, Quentin Hermans. Got to say, been impressed as well by uh, Quentin Hermans today. Absolutely. I think it was a fantastic day. He had, like I said, he's on a great bit of form this year. He's just, uh, he's really motivated. He looks like he's really had a nice season. Very, uh, very complete year coming in. He had a good road season, riding some really good races on the road. And, um, and yeah, as you see them all starting to come out for the podium, third place here, Corne Van Kessel from the Telenet Balawaza team. There you have Corne Van Kessel. Good to see him on the podium today. Happy with uh, that performance. So second and a third for them today. Elise a bit just uh, again going through the uh, how the race was won with everybody uh, around the podium. Great little trophies for the riders. Quentin Hermans is your second place rider. A great performance. Shakes hands with his uh, teammate. So good uh, ride uh, by him today. I think they can take a lot of positives away from this one. The uh, telling it Bal was uh, lines, just that stroke of bad luck from uh, Tone Arts coming into the uh, the final laps after that chase. Ellie's a bit you see there with the the protein shake in the pocket. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, these guys are going to be happy with what's happened here today. They're chinking away at the armor of Ilya Easterbit. You know, is someone's form on the way up? Is someone's form on the way down? Can he hold this pace for the entire season? Um, only time will tell, but definitely Ilya Easterbit going to be happy going home tonight after a couple pecks in the cheek here. He's going to be really excited about, again, taking another victory and um, taking home a pretty cool trophy in the meantime as well. Here's indeed, there you have it. There is your podium, Elise Bits, Quentin Hermans and uh, Corny Van Kessel. There's your, uh, your shots there of your winner today. A great ride. What a season he is having. We always uh, kind of uh, pull apart these uh, early season races, especially when someone is as uh, strong as uh, Ellie Isabit has been so far this season. We kind of into this point, aren't we, Jeremy? We think, as you just said, can he hold this form for the for the entire season? He's got to play that long game as well, isn't it? It's getting into that. Uh, we've got to. He will again want to be on that form all the way through to the to the World Championships.
Yeah, uh, like I said, he's got great coaches. He's got great staff. He's got great resources. I'm sure that he's. Uh, I'm sure that he's got a lot of uh, resources to be able to tell him, "Hey, this is what we're thinking. This is what you know it looks like from year to year, and um, this is where you're at." And so um, I guarantee that he's got his hand on the pulse and that he knows exactly what he's doing. So, uh, like I said, time will tell. A great day of racing. Don't forget, we want your video clips, gcn.eu forward slash upload your uh, your triumphs, your little fails, anything you want to send in, just if you just want to say hi uh, here on GCN Racing. So gcn.eu forward slash upload, and we will put together a little montage. But that's it for today. Make sure you join us next Saturday for the next round of the Telenet Super Prestige Series from Jeremy Powers over there in the USA and myself, Martin McDonald. We'll see you next week. Bye for now.